Hello and welcome to Charisma Vacuum Media's reviews and retrospectives. This one's a special one this week. We are taking on the rebuild of Evangelion series. This is the first in the series, Evangelion 1.0. You are not alone. My name is Daniel and I'm joined as always by my co-host, Mr. Matt. Mr. Matt, the Evangelion series means a lot to us. Um, I think for people that watch the rest of this episode, they're going to find out just how much it means to us. I can't wait for this. It's it's exciting times. It's nice to be talking about a movie that we're actually passionate about. That's it, the that's it, a big difference, isn't it? <laughs> it? It is. Yeah, I was actually at a loss. It's like, well, what are we going to talk about? Because we can't pick apart the plot. All we can really say is like, oh, it's like the series, but better animated at times. <laughs> and then talk about the series, which is going to be boring for those that have seen it and boring for those that haven't seen it. So this is complete self indulgence. But I don't care because I want to talk about you're not alone. Yes. Yes. Um, comparisons with the series are inevitable, I think, um, with this. And I think um, watching it again, it plays, I think, to people that have already seen the series. Mm. People that haven't seen it can definitely watch it. Um, but I think you do get more out of it knowing the series and um, then going back and watching this. And I think that's definitely what uh, we'll get into bits more information yeah. explaining things in a bit but i'll just continue this line of thought i think um i know um Hideaki Anno, the creator of evangelion um watched the series back is, is my understanding and thought oh that's interesting and then uh from that i want to expand on what we've already done and this film 1.0 um uh, covers the first six episodes and it, in a lot of ways, it's shot for shot and covers the same beats. But there's also a lot um, extra in there. Despite being 20 minutes short of what those six episodes are, uh, it really moves along at a pace at times. Mm. And it manages to um, cram so many iconic moments in. While also introducing um, little little background moments that aren't in the original series. That flesh out this world so much more. I think it's only... Um, coming back to this film after so long, and we'll we'll talk about that as well uh, next. Um, that I can really start to appreciate this film a lot more because it came out and we loved it. We thought it was great, but I think at the back of my mind, maybe perhaps at the time, there was a slight disappointment about how much, you know, was the same. Was the same. Yeah. Mm. Um, but as I say, going going back to it now, you can pick up on the subtleties. Um, because things aren't as fresh of, of how they, you know, expanded Shinji a bit more and expanded um, all these characters into ways that would affect them going forward into um, Rebuild 2 and 3. Um, <laughs> but, but we'll deal with that. So <laughs> that little um, blurb out the way, let's go back in time. Let's go back to 2007. Um so uh, this is this is going to be a bit of indulgence on Matt and my part, so you'll have to excuse this. I remember saying to you, and I think we've, we've I've told this story before on the podcast, at least twice. Yeah, I said to you in two thousand seven, uh, Matt, this doesn't mean anything to you at the minute, but there's just been an, an announcement made that uh, that one of the the best anime series of all time is about to get a remake, and this doesn't mean anything to you, but it will. This is going to be amazing. And and you said to me, oh, Japanimation? <laughs> 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 he didn't, but I'm making fun of the, uh, of the lexicon at the time. And um, and that came to fruition. And I introduced you to Neon Genesis Evangelion, the TV series. And uh, I, uh, that changed your life as much as it changed my life, I think. Pretty much. You, you wore down my defences as well. It was a case of, let's try them on Cowboy Bebop. And we watched one episode, and sure, it's a damn fine episode, but I was completely green to anime, outside of having seen an episode of Dragon Ball Z when I was a child and thinking, what the, what is this? This isn't smooth and clean animation. This isn't <laughs> Dexter's Lab. Where are the bold edges? Um, and then you were like, ah, that, that didn't quite work. We'll circle back around to that. Let's try him on Akira. He likes weird shit and body horror and, and monstrous imagery. And I was like, you know, you know, I do like this. Um, <laughs> and so after Christmas, I was willing to sort of, well, he was he was on the board about Akira. And you were like, well, it's sort of like Monster of the Week with, with giant robots and there's a bit more to it, but we, we won't go into that. But um, just try it out, see what you think. And all right, fine, what else are we going to do? And um, yeah, what a journey. I can't remember at what point we started 
uh, double billing it with Azamanga Dio. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, that became our nightly indulgence because I, I like to take things very slow. I'm very old school in that I like to watch an episode and then go, all right, let's leave it there for tonight. Or maybe two episodes, and then I'm going to take take time to digest what I've watched, rather than just like, more, more, we have to have more. So we do an episode or two of Evangelion, an episode of Azamanga Dayo, and an episode of Harry Hisu's Mia. And that was our tradition for, what, about like three months? It as was. As we slowly worked our way through it, as it drove you steadily insane. It did. <laughs> it did. I... It was worth it. <laughs> I, I thought Matt was trying to um, put it off, uh, because he's like, Matt, do you, you want to watch an Evangelion? You're like... Let's watch it tomorrow. And I'm like, how the hell can you do this? Or something like <laughs> oh, When I like things, I don't like to overexpose myself. The shirt I'm wearing at the moment, by the way, mm. I have owned this since 2012. And this is my first time taking it off the coat hanger. Wow. Because I like it so much that I didn't want it to get like worn or smelly <laughs> or fade in the wash or anything else. But uh, yeah, I figured I'd like crack open the bottle tonight and uh, I love and, it. I love yeah, it. Actually, wear it. But uh, yeah, so um, that that's my methodical approach to uh, to enjoying things. It's to sort of savor them, it was. Uh, which is why I could never be an alcoholic because I would take too long to to nurse a drink and say that was very good. Let's come back to the pub tomorrow for another drink. And so, um, I think Ellie, uh, we watched the series, and um, and yeah, you loved it, and that was great. Loved it. And then not too long after we finished um, End of Evangelion, uh, You Are Not Alone was released. And mm. it is crazy to think that all these years later, we are now three weeks away from the end um, of this little rebuild saga. That's mm. that's kind of nuts. Uh, it is, especially as it was meant to have finished in 2012. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is crazy to think of. That, that we, at one point, thought we were never going to see... Uh, what is now 3.0 plus 1.0, you can not know. What is it? Thrice upon a time. Yeah. Um, it, it just seemed ludicrous that this film would ever happen because there have been no publicity material. There have been a few sketches of lampposts and that had sufficed in terms of like posters for the movie. And those were about, what, three years ago? Mm. And then all of a sudden it's like, it's happening. What? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, in like seven weeks. It was, it was. Um Yes, I will say we are three weeks out from the um, Western release of uh, the fourth rebuild film. Uh, that will be important to um, the context of how we do this episode and then the second mm. and third one. Uh, because um, I think we'll touch on theories. I think it's impossible to do the retrospective of this film without touching on the main theory um, mm. about what uh, for the fourth is going to um, reveal. Which I would like to say, I I feel I predicted it within seconds of the first movie back in w- uh, 2007, I 2008. Was, I was going to give you that credit. I was going to give you that credit. Uh, Matt picked up on it straight away. It was the first thing he said. And then um, the last thing he said uh, for the final scene <laughs> as well <laughs> <laughs> of the movie. Um, very eagle eyes. Yeah, so w- we are going to go through... So the marketing material for the fourth film does seem to indicate that you're correct with your theory right from the get-go. I was surprised at how uh, much um, insinuation there is in, mm. in, in the posters and things. But we'll we'll get to that eventually. Yeah. Um, I completely lost my train of thought of where I wanted to go now. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, where do we begin? Do we start talking about sort of our fanaticism on the series and how yours was rekindled through my... Um, um, borderline junkie style obsession about things. Once I once I take a liking <laughs> to something, I must have every bit of knowledge, every bit of memorabilia possible, um, and then I move on to the next thing. But Evangelion is one of the few where I've had to stop myself buying everything because it, they're still making merchandise for this. Not just the rebuild films. Evangelion is is such a it's impossible to understand how big Evangelion is in Japan. It's not just like Star Trek and Star Wars is big in the West. They are making bullet trains in the shape of these things. There, There is still cans of, of coffee that 
bear these fair. merchandise never ever stopped for this it is mm. huge it's probably their biggest export and it puts the west to shame in how shamelessly it's pimped out oh, it or is. how celebrated it is it's it's a toss-up i mean it's definitely more one-sided than the other but yeah. um yes uh, evangelion is just culturally significant in japan and that's what that's another thing that makes everything about this franchise so fascinating because it's not um naruto or it's not dragon ball z it's not any other of the uh, one piece it's not one of these really showing your age there my hero academia <laughs> yeah well you we all know how old i am we all know <laughs> my my era of <laughs> anime it's like the kids don't even know who harry Su- suzumiya is anymore it's, it's like that's... they don't even know what a gen one pokemon is <laughs> they don't <'cause> it's depressing <laughs> yeah that's the point yeah they don't know what harry suzumiya is that was again huge everyone was doing the dance literally took over the world and then mm. it just uh, disappeared anyway You've distracted me again. What was my point? Um, right. Sorry. Yes. The difference between Evangelion and all those franchises, and again, the fourth film has come out and just smashed all box office records, is that this isn't a series based on uh, action set pieces per se, or um, something something flashy, something fashionable. It's a psychological drama uh, mm. for, uh, just throughout from top to bottom. This deals with some of the darkest um, emotions that we as humans can go through. It's uh, depression, anxiety, uh, fear of being alone, fear in, in general, um, death, suicide. Depression, anxiety, yeah. abandonment, neglect, suicide. These are difficult um topics and themes and despite all of this running core to the central premise of what evangelion is more so than monsters uh you know monster of the weeks more so than it being a mecha anime it dives into our deepest insecurities and that is why it's such a, a so baffling that that this transcends um pop culture almost it, it almost transcends pop culture because it is so um omnipresent in 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 japan it is weird it's it's the equivalent of if requiem for a dream <laughs> was everywhere in america that is the equivalent <laughs> it is really bizarre and that's not to say that it's not entertaining because it's mm. it's amazingly it entertaining yeah. but when i um, so we, we've gone through Matt's history. My history was that I watched this in 2002, earliest 2003 latest. I was 16, and I was in the mindset of all the usual 16-year-old stuff, you know, depression and and um, difficulties at school and girls and all that kind of thing. And Neon Genesis Evangelion came along with its main themes of, of, of this kid um, that just didn't know <laughs> how to get on in life and 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 just everyone wanted something from him and he was doing his best and it still wasn't good enough and um there was just for, for all the shit that Shinji gets and Shinji gets so much shit so oh, much shit so much shit i related to him more so than uh, any other character i'd seen at, at, at that point and um and I'll always, it's, it's become a meme at this point, you know, getting the robot Shinji. And, um, <laughs> and Shinji's a whiny crybaby bitch and, and all this yeah. kind of thing. But um, at the time when I saw it, when I was, you know, close to that age, it really hit home. And I'll, I'll always defend Shinji. One of the things I think about the Rebuild series that Anno does really well is that he may be cleans up shinji a little bit more and, yeah that was um, one of the first things that we spoke about because it, it's really noticeable when you go back to the original series just how almost at times unwatchable shinji is yeah. in the the anime because yeah he's he's so much more likable and upbeat and positive is maybe a bit of a stretch but well that's it i there is a bizarre positivity that shines out of him, despite the fact that he still holds all the same 
opinions and values that he did in the series. He just, the way he expresses himself, um, it's not as though there's any less um, self-pity. Or maybe there is less self-pity, but I think the thing with Shinji in this film is, is just that he manages to um, explain himself better. Mm. Um, and he goes toe-to-toe at times in this film with his um with the adults and that's maybe not as um done as well in the series where he's just like nah, don't make me on the robot and da, da, da. and i felt um in this the first thing that really hit me as i say it flies along at a pace and when i noticed that within the first 10 minutes um something that i didn't get from the series that i got from this was that i thought the adults in this are real monsters. Oh, and yeah, they're horrific. <laughs> they are just terrible. And yeah. everyone loves Mustato, but she's as bad as, as any of them. Oh, with, yeah, with, absolutely. With, with the way that she treats Shinji. And um, and I don't know if that's just me just, you know, opening my eyes to, to things all these years later or what, but I, I really felt that in this. I felt the way that Shinji explained himself um, kind of made me realize that this kid, his mum died. He was abandoned by his father. Um, he's lived his entire life alone. He's had to, you know, teach himself how to grow up. He's never experienced love or friendship. And then the only time that his dad offers a hand out to him, it's to be used. And not only mm. is it to be used, it's to do... It's, it's, it's in a position where he's effectively responsible for the fate of humanity yeah. and to have all this crushing expectation suddenly put on you. And then the person who had been, had picked you up and was all nice to you and really friendly. And suddenly she turns on you, which is something that Masato does. And we'll touch on that in the scene by scene in a little bit. And that really affected me, actually all these adults ganging up on this kid. And, um, again, I don't know if it's all because it's, um, contained now within this, one hour, 40 minute film. And it, it, it breezes by. I was stunned. For some reason, I mm. thought it was a lot longer. Um, but it, it's so to the point. And I really felt as though Shinji is so complete in this. You, you can you can feel his um, the, the different directions he's being pulled. And there's a part where he's fighting the... Um, it'll be the fourth angel, wasn't it? With the, with the tentacles. And he says, Masato gives him the order to retreat. And he's like, I mustn't run away. Because that's what they told him. You can't run mm. away from this. And so he gets it in his head, like, I can't run away. Uh, th this is this is what I need to do to get mm. approval. Um, I need to do my job. This is, this is how I'm going to, you know, my dad will love me. And everyone will say, good job. And he does it. And people still beat him down for it. Yeah, they still beat him down and on it. And it's, it's like, so what can I do? Mm. And... Um, yeah, so so just things like that, just from one scene to the next, I think uh, the way Shinji's presented is, is so much more sympathetic. And uh, you start to really resent the characters that maybe I was a bit too naive when I first saw it. And I just saw Misato on face value of being like, oh, you know, she's just a cool aunt and she has a yeah. penguin and she drinks. And, you know, she's got her insecurities and things with guys and, and she's perhaps, a you know, a bit... Uh, loose um but, but she, she's trying at but least she's trying. she's trying to bring shinji into the fold but in a very superficial way yeah exactly you you see mm. more of her edges i think in this and uh that is what i think this does really well as i say it's just tighter it is it is more to the point i think mm. and, and you feel um the 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 angles of all these characters more so i think the only i i might be getting this wrong and I'll let you speak in a second, I promise. <laughs> I what does be, that have to say? <laughs> I might be getting this wrong, but I feel the only character, perhaps, that um, it does a disservice to, um, given how important they are, is Ray. Ray. I, I agree. I was really surprised, because um, Ray always felt like um the special child i think in in the series when i mm. i didn't i didn't like ray the first time i watched the series and i didn't want to spend time with it but i felt as though i understood her 
And in this, I just feel as though she's really quite... She's just there for the sake of being there. In Well, when she's even there, to be honest. I was shocked when we got to the midway point, and it, it treats it a lot like a, a TV special. You get midway through the movie, and then it you know shows the, the title card, and then it moves on to the next scene. That was pretty much the point when they went, oh, yeah, Ray. Right. <laughs> we'll get to her in part two. <laughs> and then part two happens, and then it's like, ah, oh, now we begin... Pretty much the entire second half of the movie is um, episodes five and six, which are called Ray, Ray yeah. One and Ray Two, yeah. um, and uh, it's borderline shot for shot, isn't it? They condense a lot of the first four episodes uh, to make it work. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know whether I'd feel that going back and rewatching the series, but it, it did feel like Ray was an afterthought, sort of thrown in, especially um, as we see how her character develops into the the next movie. Mm. Uh, it's probably well. It's definitely because in a TV show you've you've got more time, even if it's only an extra minute or two overall to spend with these characters. And the movie's got a lot of setting up to do, um, and a lot of flashy whiz bang action to fit in as well, which Ray wasn't a part of because of circumstance uh, until the the fifth angel shows up. So I guess it's having to work with what they've got. So as I'm going to say, not to show their hand too early. It's one thing to have slight character tweaks and mm. a few little subtle background changes here and there but to you know they, they wanted the rug pull to be the final scene of the movie that's when you and i were both like what yeah that's the moment they wanted um so yeah to do anything drastic with ray i think would have been tipping their hand too early mm -hmm. so i can see why they did it but yeah it, it does leave it all feeling a little bit flat particularly as she's the essentially the gateway to his father's affection yeah in in his eyes uh which is what essentially the the first chunk of this movie is all about just trying to get his father's approval if nothing else because of how he inter interacts with her but um anyway sorry do do continue no I, I pretty much said everything um yeah i just wanted to fall on uh on on ray um as i say it's really i just think it, it it is so tight and Ray is the only thing that, that I think is just lacking. And we see Ray's an, another, um, she, she's a bit like Shinji where you can feel there's a little bit more to a, a character in this one. Um, or maybe I'm, I'm just misremembering things, but, uh, but they just, they just don't go into it enough was the scene there in the original series and again i apologize to to the people for for not knowing this off my head we we really wanted to do a retrospective on the, the series but it's just kind of how things have caught up with us all of a sudden um in the series was there that shot of her talking to gendo with with a smile on her face yeah yeah there was okay yeah right. that's that's still there yeah okay all right. Uh, well, that kind of shits on my point, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can pretend it isn't. <laughs> we can pretend. I mean, it could be. Uh, which version of the film did you watch? Because um, uh, these films like to be confusing, if not obtuse. The theatrical release was called uh, Evange Rebuild of Evangelion 1.01. .01. You cannot redo. Uh, you cannot read. No, you, you are cannot... not alone. Wasn't it? You were not yeah. alone, sorry. Yeah, yeah. you're not alone. Um, and then when it came out on Blu-ray, they retitled it 1.11, which had three extra minutes of, uh, yeah. of footage in. Um, so uh, I'm just curious, do you know which version you watched? Did that flash up on the screen? Um, I watched 1.11. All right, okay. So I just wondered if maybe we'd, we'd seen slightly different versions. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So another thing that we can talk about is just how amazing it looks from the oh. original as well. And I was watching this and I was stunned to think mm. that this was made in 2007. Yeah, and this film's 14 years old and it is beautiful. It is. It really is. And I... So I finished watching the film and then I went back to the original episodes because um, I just wanted to see where the beats were predominantly mm. as to, you know... Um, what was included, what was cut out, and just have a, a brief... was tightened. Yeah, exactly. Um, but the main thing I noticed was just how vastly superior the animation is, considering that the series was 1995. 95. Mm. Yeah. And when I was watching... All the, all the other times I've watched the series, it just looked... It just looked like Evangelion. It looked like it's it should. Um, but then watching it after this... It looks so um, 
raw. Uh, raw. It looks of its time. Yeah. It looks so much of its time. The animation is inconsistent. The character designs are inconsistent. You know, they're all like angled and yeah, and, 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 chins. and stuff. And I thought this never looked... Did it always look like this? <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine when they release this on Blu-ray. Evangelion has never looked worse. The original <laughs> series says you've never seen it before. My eyes! <laughs> <laughs> and and that made me appreciate the uh the rebuild even uh, e- even more um mm. to think that um there was you know I mean, well from 95 to 2007 you know just over 10 years but mm. um oh god it's longer since well here's an interesting factoid for you uh production on this film began the autumn of 2002 wow apart from six months where uh uh, Hadi Akiano uh, went on to other production work uh, and it went on a brief hiatus. But uh, yeah, they they spent four four years working on this before it got the theatrical release. Wow. And it shows. It they, shows. They put a lot of time into this. It is This stunning. wasn't some crapped out into cinema because we know it will make money no matter what sort of <clears throat> MCU deal. But um, yeah, th- this was a, a lovingly, painstakingly made film and mm. every single frame shows it. Yeah, yeah. It does. It does. Um, every every single frame could be um, a, a wallpaper on your PC. As far as I'm mm. concerned, it's just stunning. It is stunning. I, I had that at one point for. Um, <clears throat> it was shortly after we'd seen the second film, and again because I'm a hoarding collector, I'm better now than I used to be. But I would literally collect every single screen grab I could get, just to put it in a folder, and basically you could watch the entire series through almost like a flip chart from uh, from my sort of (laughs) save documents um and i found a really nice mosaic of like the the main story beats of the second film and that was my wallpaper for the longest time oh wow that's that's another that's another story we could have told about um our our days back in the day when things were oh so different the uh Mm. the the heady days of the mid 2000s um collecting um all the artwork and you know scenes and whatever else just just putting uh evangelion Mm. into uh, the old school Google image search and just be like, oh, I don't have that image. I don't have that Ooh, image. Oh, I found a JPEG. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost thumbnail sized. And just building the library of Evangelion images. And it's those uh, few gifts place. as well. Remember, you had like a folder with like, what, four Asker gifts and one of Ray Smiling? And that was like the most amazing thing ever because yeah. gifts were, were a rare treat back in the early 2000s. And they were. They were special times. Um, but anyway, moving on. That just goes to show how far we've come in the last. Um, mm. Uh, 14 years um, 14 yeah so uh, looks amazing um, and sounds amazing yeah I was I was just trying to I was trying to segue the two <laughs> I was trying to say <laughs> it looks amazing and you realise uh, it, it just all your senses just sort of feel uh, satiated um, mm. in just so many different parts of this where you are just in awe of what you're looking at and then the score as well and just in my mind I'm just being bombarded at the minute it, it has one of the all-time great scores and and that's an, another thing that's a positive about watching the film over the series is that these songs are introduced episode by episode essentially you know each each episode has like a um a, a, a song <clears throat> or character theme exactly and that was my point like ray becomes a focus ray gets a theme uh you have uh, like risco misato they all and then <laughs> they all have their moments and they all have their themes and but they're all chopped up into different episodes with a film and with it being mm. one minute at uh, one hour 40 minutes you're just treated to all of them all of them come in at some point and it's just the most. Uh, it's. I don't know if it's. It, the it's nost- bombarding. I don't know if it's the nostalgia talking or what, but you <laughs> you just you just feel full and mm. um, satisfied to hear all you know. Angel attacks as, as well. Um, yeah. Angels is- of Doom. Um, uh, Operation Yashimia, which he's reused in multiple films. It's reused in Shin Godzilla, oh, really? along with. A lot of the Raymiel, uh, the the fifth angel, a lot of the Raymiel, like full on oh, destruction wow. of the city. He redid that for Shin Godzilla, effectively in in Godzilla now. Um, so clearly, it's a favourite of his. When we see, when we say he, it is uh, Shiro uh, Sagisu, um, that 
did uh, that did the complete score for the film. I could have told you that. I've I've got the uh, the complete soundtrack works right next to me here. Um, oh, yeah. Hang on. Let me just uh, try and get them in order. So, uh, yeah, you 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 are not alone. It's a nice nice special edition of that. And then all all still sealed naturally. Of course. <laughs> of course. Third one. Boom. And then as of a few months ago, the final one. Oh. I mean that's. And then naturally the the singles because all of them end with different renditions of beautiful world or um one last kiss which is the new one and for you dan just for the special nostalgia value all the original <sighs> still sealed osts there they are yes which are just glorious for their artwork alone one day i won't open them and i will still die a happy man mm-hmm. just we really are reveling in nostalgia now but mm. uh, fuck it these are you know, straight from Japan, Seal. even the live symphony. Wow. And, uh, and the 2009 remix of cruel angel thesis. I couldn't see that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's oh, amazing. I, I love it. It's, it's an amazing soundtrack, an amazing collection of, uh, scores and symphonies and, um, and to hear them redone with, um, with such clarity, they sound so clean and so rich and so warm. And I was listening to this for the first time, properly with um a uh, a really rich sound system in in the proper 5.1 surround and just the oh, just it, it enveloped me mm. the the score the sound effects the explosions the whole thing i you know i've watched heaven Gellion with the sound turned up before just to get that full like mm. feeling um but this was the first one that i had the the full surround system working oh, wow. and it sounded so good yeah that <laughs> so, is so good. good that is amazing so yeah we like the music. <laughs> <laughs> and then, I promise we do like the music. We're not making this up. <laughs> and then, uh, and then, as you say, um, A Beautiful World. And another Ooh. one which, uh, again, is very special to us personally because of uh, the context of, of, of when the film came out. And we, we were both at university and uh, flatmates. And, and uh, because we're like ultra og weebs um we we just played this song over and over again and just sort of indulged in in mm. uh in, in that feeling of the film finishing in this song coming on and it, it is oh. a good song all these years later it, it's, it's still it's still perfect. A good song. there are a few moments uh where the ending of a film is so perfectly matched with uh an end credit song or score and every single time uh, the screen goes blank and the bars of Beautiful World kick in. My heart swells and I get somewhat emotional because I just am catapulted back to... We started watching it at five in the morning uh, on a summer day. We had the flat to ourselves. We started at five and, you know, we're like, allowing for pausing and bathroom breaks and the, ooh, discussions about half, six, seven o'clock by the time we finished. And uh, I'm instantly catapulted back to that, 7 a.m. in the morning stint just coming out of that film just going wow that was an experience i'll never mm. forget and sure enough 14 years later it's still it's like a time machine sending me all the way back yeah i love it it's it's a beautiful song i've, I've got the it's not here it's upstairs but i i've naturally got the uh the single as well mm. and that's but the thing that's just incredible that's something that's uh having evangelion has, has always managed and we won't go into it too much uh We'll have to do an end of Evangelion um, R and R at some point, mm. but uh, "Comes to Sitard from that is another just yes. perfect, perfect, perfect song. Um, so they've done amazing. I'm just reading here that um, that the score was recorded at Abbey Road Studios and performed by the London Studio Orchestra, which is pretty amazing to think as well. We should have known that. In fact, I I saw them crop up last night, but I thought <laughs> I was watching the fly both. Both original flies, the Cronenberg one and the Vincent Price one last night, and uh, the London Symphony Orchestra did that as well. So I thought I just conflated the uh, the films. <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't. Um, God, I, I just want to say so much before we go into the um, scene by scene still, because I feel as though there's still so much to say, even outside uh, of the film itself. Um, yeah, I mean, the production woes i mean we can talk a little bit about uh evangelion's life on television that inevitably led to end of evangelion and and how that has potentially led to the rebuild films yeah sure did that 
Uh, sure. I mean, uh, Dan can do a much better job of, of the history of it, but um, what started off with the basic sort of mecha series of the week was some, you know, some heady themes and uh, some undertones of mental illness and uh, and abuse and, and trauma. Um, uh, Anno uh, uh, sunk into a depression midway into the production and decided to use the series as his therapy, essentially. And so what became a sort of, by that point, somewhat more lightweight series that was a bit more buoyant, a bit more jokey, a bit more fun, suddenly at the episode... 15 mark became this absolutely traumatizing deep dive uh into you know what is what is a human what is happiness why is misery um and uh, just that they they were horrified sponsors pulled out the budget for the show dwindled rapidly uh it didn't stop him you know pursuing more and more uh interesting avenues with the show but um I think it's fair to say that the final two episodes left a lot of people very cold uh, to downright hostile. Uh, it led to a lot of death threats and, uh, and attacks on the studio. And so a couple of years later, in 97, they said, all right, well, we'll do sort of an alternative ending that sort of slots in. You can sort of overlay them. Um, and that will be the big action-packed cinematic finale. And so they released a sort of... Um, Death and Rebirth first, which the first 40 minutes is a very condensed but really well done recap of the series up to episode 24. Um, and then the second half was the first 45 minutes of End of Evangelion. Uh, that would be the Rebirth part. And uh, um, I mean, my God, those first 45 minutes deliver exactly what I feel the fans wanted. And then when End of Evangelion end of evangelion came out obviously we had we'd seen the first 45 minutes so it's like oh okay how's this going to wrap up in the final final chunk and again anno being anno it went into some very existentialist um and interesting directions that while brilliant absolutely astounding and ballsy and just one of the most iconic images in all of uh in all of anime it led to even more death threats and everything else on top of it. So in many ways, you think, was he pressured into bringing it back with a happier ending? Or did he feel that he could continue it? Or it was a cash cow that could be milked further? Was it a, an almost a fan apology of, I was in a dark place, let's redo this from the start? We're not going to know for a few more weeks. But um, yeah, to say that Evangelion had a turbulent life on television and cinema up to this point is uh, somewhat of an understatement. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny you, you tell that story. I've just got a bit on the production here. So in September 2006, the October edition of Japanese anime magazine New Type, uh, the first film of the rebuild of Evangelion series was announced to be released in the summer of 2007. An expected runtime of 90 minutes. During pre-production, uh, Toshimichi Otsuki, Otsuki uh, stated that director Hideaki Anno rewatched the entire original television series back-to-back it was revealed the success of the series had, had caused misunderstanding and disarray amongst fans, and the new films would clear up any confusion. Uh, in the December 2006 issue of New Type, Anna revealed he was happy to finally recreate Eva as he wanted it to be, as he wanted it to be, in the beginning, and that he was no longer constrained by technological and budget limitations. Um, so that's a little bit more on that. I mean, the irony, of course, would be what happened after three and the mm. uh, <laughs> and the like uh, <laughs> ten years we've experienced without anything since. But as which I say, is incredible to think about. It took the best part of ten years between those two films. Yeah, but we got Shin Godzilla out of it, which which was worth it, I would say, but uh, only in hindsight. Um, as the um, man. Um, who's been placed in charge of all of the differences between the series and the film? Do you want to just have a brief run through of uh, anything interesting that uh, that you might have seen that's taken um, your fancy? Yeah, I mean there were a couple of different things. This is sort of like spoiler alert, but by uh, this point, you know people are either on board with it and uh, and curious or not. Um, we're introduced to the angel Lilith uh, in this film at the uh, one hour, 15 minute mark, which is really interesting for fans because it took until episode 15 when she was first introduced yeah. and uh, mis misidentified by the characters as Adam because there's a lot of um, theological referencing in Evangelion right from the offset. You know, there's uh, crucifixes uh, practically everywhere. There's a lot of um, Dead Sea Scrolls and biblical references and Judaism. Uh, all the angels are named from different... Um, 
Judaic figures, uh, which are really interesting when you read into. Um, oh, I forget which one, but um, oh, Badriel, what, uh, my personal favourite, um, is uh, Shameful Tears, which you know sort of all ties into uh, character thematics. That's um, that's, that's something. Have... That's something. Um, I don't know if I said it explicitly, but I wanted to touch on it earlier. Is that the benefit of this film as well? Is obviously with with hindsight of everything that came before it. Anna was very much. Um, it turned into a situation where he was making everything up on the spot. You know, he 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 had this um, vision going into it, and then things changed uh, as we as we just read, and um, and you know, as I say, he was kind of writing it and rewriting it as as on a week to week basis almost. Um, this definitely goes back to those six episodes with a view of the entire story, and that's mm. very much to its benefit. We, as you say, we're introduced to uh, Zele. I think we've got a more secure understanding of what their intentions are um, a lot earlier in this, I think. Mm -hmm. That's true. When does Zele first appear in the series? you remember? Um, I think, don't they... Do they... Subtly. They, don't they get an appearance in episode one or six or something, but not much? Um, I think you just see, like, the head guy or maybe the, the, the slate. Yeah. But it's not until, again, round about episode... Fifteen, when shit really hit the fan, yeah. that, uh, that they became a presence within the show. Yeah, ex yeah, I think so. You understand, uh, essentially, you understand the, even more the various layers to which mm. this kind of conspiracy uh, unfolds, and um, at least you do until the third film, <laughs> where it all comes <laughs> off the rails. Yeah, and as you were saying, um, the introduction of L Lilith as well just brings all of that home a lot sooner mm. and um and you know as i was saying earlier if you've seen the show you understand how much that means that this has come at an early point and again in the final scene with caro on the moon Ooh, uh, caro on the moon with his harpoon um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry futurama can't help it <laughs> uh you know as 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 viewers that have stuck with this series and uh dug into all the lore it just has that extra special meaning of mm. of feeling ingrained within the lore now rather than just it appears later because yeah. of you know the writer was figuring out what he wanted to do sorry carry on well e e even little tweaks like um again this means nothing to people that haven't seen the show but um lilith is basically um uh, the pilbury doze boy but with its legs missing and lots of little human legs sticking out from underneath it, nailed to a gigantic crucifix. This thing is huge, bleeding forever into a pool from which uh, the uh, Evangelions can sort of be harvested and grown. And in the series, she's wearing like a purple faceplate. And it's very iconic to, to the sort of character's image and a lot of uh, sort of like the, the imagery and iconography comes from that. And in this version, we not only see Lilith, you know, many many hours ahead of when we should but she's got a completely different face which is that all of the angels basically have these like beaky skull faces and she has that and and again this was for conspiracy nuts like us like what what the fuck does this mean mm. especially when we're on the moon with carrie later and we see the real lilith on the moon it's like what is happening now? <laughs> uh, so it's it's little bits and pieces like that that again, people that really aren't interested won't give a shit about us fanboying out right now. But um, yeah, e even even things like the the skin tone of of the Evangelions because <clears throat> um, basically the Evangelions are cyborgs. They're like organic beings, gigantic beings that are grown up clad in armor that control them then essentially the children pilots are put into a little plug and inserted into them and they pilot these giant mecha mush goliaths um and uh, and that leads to some very interesting stuff later on in the series um but uh, from what we sort of slowly glimpse of what lies beneath the evangelion armor throughout the series we first tease it which doesn't appear in the film all you see is this horrific human skull wrapped in bandages with this bulging eye and sort of like dark patches of skin almost like deeply blood soaked muscle uh, and every single time like the armor's burnt away like during a later fight with the, the fourth angel in, in the series the, the armor plating's burned away on the hand and it's got again this sort of like blood red leathery skin 
And in this version now, it's peachy human skin, which yeah. uh, so I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of. I, I know what they're going for, but it, it just doesn't work for me. But again, little moments like that, like, oh, ooh, that's that's interesting. The Evangelions are far more human than they used to be. Yeah, um, uh, that's that, that was my understanding of the change. I noticed that as well. There does seem to be that more. Uh, uh, they wanted to make it a bit more obvious that um, that these were, you know, like, human in in their construction almost mm. and uh make it even more um immoral i suppose or just questionable yeah. the idea of uh what they're doing to these creatures and uh just adds to you know the perception of gendo as this mm. monster and all that kind of thing <laughs> um sorry uh what uh anything else any any other changes uh, just the, the two other, the, the major changes are, um, just for me personally, really, um, Shinji, like you said earlier, was a lot more palatable, a lot more soft around the edges, um, whereas in the original, the, the, the a bit that really stuck out to me is when Misato is sort of uh, working out his living arrangements, and um, it's like, oh, he's going to be living alone, we'll just ship him off, and in the series, he's very downcast, and just like, you know, whatever, I'm, I'm used to it, i am just got to live alone, I'll die alone, I'm miserable, I'm Shinji. And in the film, it's a bit more like, hey, come see, come sir. What are you going to do? It's more like like Morty, when Morty gets a bit of confidence. Like, <laughs> uh, you know what? Let's go live. It's fine. I got this. Um, which makes it more endearing and a bit more sort of tragic. Uh, but the, uh, the main change, apart from Caru on the Moon and Lilith, uh, is Ramiel, the, the official, what was once the fifth angel, but is now rejigged into, what, the seventh or something? <laughs> in the original show, it's just a geometric shape. Mm. It's just a giant blue cube that floats through the sky i mean the, the others are, are quite interesting you've got sakiel who's this sort of like giant walking bird skeleton and then sam shell uh, sham cell which is basically a giant penis there's no getting around it it's it's a dick <laughs> with whips um unavoidably so and then you know a, a giant cube and it's just like uh, okay um but but in this film they do some wacky and wild things with that geometric shape it is amazing what they do with ramiel the um that takes up the last um f uh 40 minutes i think uh, of the, hour, of, of the film and mm. that was the biggest surprise watching it for the first time and um interesting watching it back um that as i say they they cram uh the first five episodes into the first hour essentially and then the last 40 minutes is pretty much a set piece. And it, yeah. it, it turns it into this, um, uh, what is kind of a, a character study uh, for various character studies into more of an action set piece. And um, it's an interesting change, but I, I, I think it, it works. Um, mm. Because it does a lot to explore Shinji and Rei within it. Within this, and Masato as and, well, and Masato as well, mm. and another thing that I really enjoyed that they brought more into this film were the inner workings of Nerve and more conversations between Masato and uh, and and and, and Risco and Risco, mm. um, and just how Tokyo Three worked, which we don't get in the series. That was one of the things that always irked me. I think in the back of my head was just mm. there was you never really felt as though this was a living city. Um, yeah, and and I was always confused as to why people would. I'm still confused as to why people would live there. It doesn't make any sense, just because. Yeah, I, I get confused. <laughs> like, are they living in the the skyscrapers still? Because yeah. basically, Tokyo Tokyo was destroyed. An event happened called the Second Impact. Pretty much everything on Earth died. The seas are now nothing but blood, just red blood, which is another departure. There's the all the water in this part from lakes are now just blood red. Again, maybe tying to uh, to what's going on previously. Um, but uh, I've lost my train of thought. Uh, talking about how musing about no one would live in Tokyo Three. Yeah, no one would live in Tokyo Three, and I couldn't work out if people are living in the skyscrapers that are sort of ascending and descending. Yeah. Or if that's just okay. We've built the infrastructure, and once we're clear of the angel attacks, we can start repopulating them. But if these are meant to be fortified against angel attacks, don't you want everybody living in them during the angel sieges? It's really bizarre. It seems to me as though every time there's an angel attack, people are evac evacuated out of these buildings. But why would you build a city on top of such an important, you know, um, government 
base that you know is just going to be attacked. I don't understand why anyone. Yeah, would it's there. a magnet. <laughs> why they... was... <laughs> the first angel attack in what fifteen years, and it instantly works out where Lilith is and mm. comes right for Nerve headquarters. <laughs> mm. And um, it is, it's weird and it's baffling from a, you know, from a common sense standpoint, from a from a um, narrative standpoint. It it's it's interesting. Um, but it's hard to come up with any rational explanation unless um, you look at it in the sense of, well, everyone works for Nerve or something like that, which which I don't think they do. No, um, they don't, because so many people bitch about them when they're on the streets. Yeah, but that that would have been a good background, I think, that Nerve is such a massive operation that this city is, you know, essentially funnels the operation. I think that maybe should have been something. Um mm. But yeah, so that has always been my biggest, um, or one of my biggest problems with Evangelion in whichever form it's taken is that it doesn't explain um, Tokyo 3 enough and its mm. inhabitants. But at the same time, uh, I think this one explores it a little more. It's good to see the workers and there seems to be a real camaraderie, especially in the final set piece, which... I really liked. Uh, I don't yeah. know if you picked up on. You've you've just got all these workers, and it feels like a living, breathing operation that people mm. are committed to. It seems like everyone understands the basic goal here. Uh, in the series, maybe there's this feeling that no one really understands outside of uh, Nerve how important this this is. But Shinji says something about, yeah, I've I've heard the stories before. Um, uh, about why it's important to keep the angels away. And and that's something that's never really explained, I don't think, either, is just the grander scheme of um, people's understanding towards the an imminent apocalypse. <laughs> yeah, like they know the angels are coming for them, but beyond that, what how much, how much is that? We what, know... What this film... Yep, so all you. I was going to say, what this film really helped with was um, it actually starts laying out clues that help you understand what's going on again maybe you're in retrospect but we have gendo at about the midway point just going oh this is all because of the deal we made with lilith all those years ago essentially it's like we didn't have that in the original if we did it was buried under so much of the psycho babble like mm. in episode 17 or 18 or 20 when stuff was really sort of like laying on the the, the thicker rich mythology whereas in this it was like oh that would have been really useful information to know you know there's sort of a covenant going on with lilith that makes so much more sense because we're her descendants and all that jazz and we're trying to stop the new angels sort of like breeding and becoming the new face of like gl the global elite. So it's like, yes, that would have been really helpful to know <laughs> at yeah. the time. I mean, we haven't even really covered the beats of the story yet, have we? We've spoken like nearly okay. an hour and we haven't even done a story summary. We're just <laughs> assuming that you all know what the hell we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so just finally a little bit on the point I was making, I, I think as though there is more of an effort made to kind of uh look into tokyo 3 even if it doesn't do enough um because yeah i i'll, I'll repeat it why would you build a city above the, the most important uh you know uh infrastructure in the entire world at this point mm. and i've always found it fascinating from an international point of view as well obviously it makes sense from a um creators in japan you know you're japanese you're writing for a japanese audience therefore things happen in japan um but uh we find out in the series um obviously evangelions are a worldwide thing because um we have Asuka from from germany and then of course um the doomed american branch the, the, the american branch is that where unit um uh toji's which one? Uh, it is, something? yeah. It's the uh, unit four explodes, yeah. which is on uh, American soil because they're mass producing them, aren't they? The Americans are mass producing them. Uh, they're still the prototypes uh, because you've got uh, the prototype that Ray drives, the first official Evangelion that Shinji drives, the first prototype that can run on bat uh, on battery power rather than you know needing a cord, and that's Asuka's, and then. Pretty much units four through thirteen, or is it seventeen? Four through seventeen, they're all manufactured in America. Mm. But then, when four mysteriously blows up, they say, "Oh fuck this! We're transferring unit three over to you to deal with it." Just to, on the off chance, um, and and that's how we get unit three. 
Yeah. Um, so it is very much an international operation, even though they don't fully explore uh, the international implications, because it does very much seem, it seems very insular in that you've got this tiny uh, little section of, uh, of, of, of Japan that um, is kind of responsible for the... Um, uh, the existence of all of humanity. <laughs> and... If I was going to ask any country to build a giant cybernetic robot to defend humanity, I'm not going to ask the Dutch to be there to <laughs> plan on it. And it makes sense because Lilith, uh, was it Adam fell uh, in Antarctica, wasn't it? And uh, Lilith, Lilith's egg is in the geo front, which is underneath Tokyo. So it sort of makes sense to make that the base of operations. Mm. Oh, I'm just sort of being ultra logical and, you know, just trying to bitch for the sake of bitching that uh, <laughs> there isn't, you know, the, at, at the beginning of the film, uh, we see the um, uh, the army in charge, and uh, then I think we're told that Nerve is a branch of the UN. Um, but that's kind of it with regards to the ge- geopolitical implications of this, and so mm. uh, we until just... the second film, which opens with some very bad English, mm. really, really bad English. It's distractingly bad. Uh, is that with? Um... I forgot her name. What's her name? Archie. Mm, yeah. Um, but we'll get onto that yeah. later. I don't think that's even subtitled. It's it's really painful because <laughs> the second film opens with like two Americans, really bad American voice actors, talking their American thing like Americans. Uh, so it's like, we don't need subtitles. That's in English. And then Kaji comes along, who is not... It, he can get the words out, but not pronounce them properly. And it's like, I, I'm trying to follow your techno babble in Japanese English, and it just sounds so bad. Could we at least have <laughs> subtitles? <laughs> <laughs> but that's enough of my racism <laughs> for now for now plenty more of that later um right so we kind of touched on all the characters we've touched on the uh, well we haven't touched on the story but we'll get that in we haven't even thing. touched on the characters really who's gendo who is gendo uh that's true um but i mean shinji's the predominant one and i think he has the most changes to him so we've, we've kind of dealt with that and a bit of uh misato and ray so we'll we'll d- we'll deal with the other ones uh within the scene by scene um okay. ba, 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 ba. done a bit about the production this is why i need notes <laughs> <laughs> do you want to do you want to um dive into the brief synopsis and then do the scene by scene because we're an hour into the show now i think this is sure. the longest we've gone without um I don't know if we've actually said anything yet. Like, It's a stream of consciousness yeah. at the moment. I don't know if anyone could actually pick up what we're talking about. Evangelion was a TV show and then it became a movie <laughs> and we like these things. <laughs> the end. I think I think that's something that people uh, have to realise is that we're not really reviews and retrospectives for beginners in this type of thing. We mm. we, we go into the, the deep end as we, as we understand them. Okay, let's do the synopsis and then... Um... We'll see if anything jumps to mind after that. And if not, we'll go for the scene by scene. So Evangelion 1.0, uh, You Are Not Alone, is a 2007 Japanese animated science fiction action film written and chiefly directed by Hedy Akiyano. It is the first of four films released in the rebuild of Evangelion Tetralogy based on the original anime series Neon Genesis Evangelion. It was produced and co-distributed by Anno's studio Kara in relationship with Gainax. Who, uh, who produced the original series. Hedy Akiano wrote the first movie and is the general director and manager for the entire project. Yoshiyuki Sadamoto provided character designs for the films, as he did uh, for the beginning, and he actually uh, did the manga, which is also mm. uh, integral to the entire Evangelion um, lore. While uh, Ukito uh, Yamashita provided mechanical designs um, bah, 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 bah. The film's focus on a young teenager named Shinji Ikari who finds he must pilot a mecha known as Evangelion Unit 1 to protect the world from mysterious creatures known as angels. The plot is largely a point-for-point adaptation of the first six episodes of the original anime. While some scenes and events are replications of the original series, others unfold differently with new or omitted scenes and newly available 3D CG technology. As we were saying... Um, I will touch on this. I think it looks great with the um, the final angel. I think they do a really good job with that. It, it looks a smidge dated now, but it, it's largely fine. The CG that does bother me, though, uh, I don't know if you feel the same way, is um, when the door opens 
to Lilith, and um, it's just like these little. Uh, I like those. You like I, that? I think it's love the design. Yeah, because they're just it's it's so cool to see something that securely locked. Basically, two drill bits. Well, thousands of two drill bits unraveling each other. I, I thought you were going to say the uh, the training simulator, which makes sense to have bad CGI because no, it's a training simulator. That is that. I just I just think that's really poor CGI, and I don't think it's. Um, uh, the, the, the perspective just to me strikes me as wrong for some reason when I see that. Anyway, the, uh. fil the film received a positive response from fans, with Anno himself calling it a faithful remake of the original series. The film was ranked as the fourth highest grossing anime film at the Japanese box office during 2007, earning a total of over $20 million worldwide. That seems paltry when we're talking about all these Resident Evil films and stuff over the mm. last couple of weeks and, and Harry Potter's. This, and still only the fourth highest in Japan in 2007. That's Madness. a surprise. That is a real surprise. Mm. That leads me to think that Evangelion maybe has only exploded in popularity since then in Japan, considering how many... Um, uh, records it has broken since. Yeah, quite possibly. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. uh, let me just. Is there anything about the uh, the first uh, the film's theatrical premiere, first of September two thousand seven. First international screening was the twelfth of October. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba, and then that's not really important just talking about the home media release and stuff uh, that's another thing as well just to go back in time was uh so we could see that this had been released when was this when, when did i say this was released it was 2007 yeah but when to then so the first international oh, september uh september 2007 you see i don't even listen to myself <laughs> um and uh yeah as i say we had to wait didn't we in fact it'll be in 2008 uh, we had to wait until 2008, 2008 because we, yeah. we we watched it when it find, when a stream and subtitles finally came available. It was what May, June, yeah, May, May, May. We had to, so yeah. we we knew it had been released, and um, we had to wait for the uh, the home release in Japan and for some kind soul to rip it and put it on the internet and subtitle it. And <laughs> those months were excruciating. <laughs> we uh, even went as far as buying in. Uh, you did as well, I'm sure, buying the Japanese version of it, which has no subtitles. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. The old chunky red box, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've got it up there. Um, in fact, uh, did I show my... I haven't shown my... This is I, I just just to show that I'm not faking it. This is uh, something Matt bought me from all those years ago. It means means the world, so... Uh, yeah. Ah, just show my little bit of merchandise, because Matt's done his. Um, box office, critical response, we've done all that kind of thing. Let's go. Over an hour right. into the, over an hour into the show, um, let's switch that there. Right, Matt, we're talking about theories. We said that we were going to dive into theories. I feel as though there's no better time than to dive into what we expect the rest of the series to hold for us than um, the opening shot. Yeah, the opening shot, the Red Sea. Goes right I right. am, uh, I'm, I'm damn sure this is a sequel. Uh, the uh, did we just go into sort of spoiler territories as to how End of Evangelion ended? Um, uh, spoilers, yeah. I, I yeah, mean, spoilers uh, from here on an hour ago. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, End of Evangelion ends with the third impact happening. The Earth is is fucked, but with a chance of being remade, maybe for the better, probably for the worse. All that's left are crucifixes, dead Evangelions, uh, a half-strangled Asuka, who we'll see in the next film, a catatonic Shinji, and the gigantic head of Rei, which is slowly being bisected and sliding into the Red Oceans. And uh, and that's how the film ends, near enough. And this one begins with a shot of Red Seas and a giant outline of, of a figure lying in, in uh, a pile of broken skyscrapers. And I immediately, from the shot, said, it's a sequel. Mm. <laughs> At some point... It's, it's happened. Third Impact's happened. Shinji has remade the world for the better in some capacity, which would explain why he's a slightly more complete human being and why, especially come the second movie, he and Asuka and Rei and everyone else are actually happy mm. because he's, he's had a chance to redo things. And even though you can't really cheat fate, it looks like you can at least nudge things along a bit uh, until the third movie happens. But we'll get to that. Yeah, we will. I um, resisted this so much because 
there is a part of me that just couldn't bear the thought of this being a sequel because I think Evangelion ends so perfectly. I wanted a fresh story. I just wanted a fresh take on it. Um, and so I didn't even think, to be honest. I can I can see it all see it all now, and it's incredibly obvious. But I, as we've spoken before, I try not to theorize in my head as I watch these things because I don't want to become disappointed ultimately. And you know, you, you can sometimes create your own theories that are better than what plays out. Cough, Star Wars sequels, um, and uh, and so I don't like to do that. And yeah, I was a bit resistant to the idea of it being a sequel. Um, but you can't get past those images, can you? And the way in which um, Tokyo... I mean, I still don't understand it, to be honest. I still don't understand how Shinji can re- recreate the world, but there's still after effects of End of Evangelion. Um, mm. But we'll go with it. Um Again, I could be wrong. It could just be an aesthetic choice, but I would. But they they make all like the hints, pizza. don't they? Mm. And coming into four, as we've said, that the marketing suggests, and a lot of theorizing by people who know even more than we do about this thing suggests that mm. this is definitely what happened. The manga is the first incident of this story taking place. And then, or maybe, I can't remember. There's a really good video on it. Anyway, I'll try and find it and maybe link it in the mm-hmm. description. Um, did I not send you that? It's like this guy with a whiteboard and he goes through yeah, all yeah, of Yeah, yeah, years and years ago. Yeah, it's so good. And I think the manga is supposedly the first instance of this happening when the series, and then obviously this concludes it all. Mm. Um, so Which would explain the thrice upon a time. Yeah, exactly. Um but yeah, aside from the little hints of things being slightly askew, the the opening plays out pretty much as um, as we understood all those years ago. So, mm-hmm. in 2015, 15 years after a global cataclysm known as the Second Impact, um, Shinji Ikari is summoned to Tokyo 3 by his estranged father, Gendo, uh, the commander of the paramilitary organization NERV. Uh, Shinji is caught in the crossfire between UN forces and an angel, an alien life form um i loved going back to these opening scenes Mm. and because they are recreated shot for shot and that was obviously done on purpose it's not done all the time throughout these series but um certain scenes in particular is just it would have been sacrilege to uh to change them yeah and this is ironically i love the misato's photo <laughs> <laughs> it never fails to get a giggle uh, isn't it more lewd it depends on which version of the translation you're reading because some um, depending on who's subtitling it depends on sort of the <laughs> the notes well but that arrow is wonderful that's the thing as well we've got to say that obviously there are various different translations of this and all of them have different um skews on things certain says that certain characters say and some you know uh, are portrayed in this way and some portrayed in that way um the i don't want to say the benefit of the dub but because obviously the the, the dub works from the uh the, the subtitles in a lot of way ways but i know that there's a big emphasis in the dub or there was with these of going to the um to the original uh, script writers and things and, mm. and directors and, uh, um, you know, vocal directors and things and saying, what did you intend with this? And then trying to replicate that into the dub. So, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but there is potentially uh, a bit more um, authenticity there from the yeah, dub than I'll over that. subtitles. But I don't know. I don't know. I, I couldn't possibly say these things. That's just one thing to consider. I do know with regards to um, the end of Evangelion, I forget the voice actress for Shinji, but I, 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 Shinji, for Asuka, uh, Asuka. Uh, um, Tiffany Grant, Tiffany Grant. Yes, that's it, well remembered. Um, I think she had insight into the meaning of that as well, the the, the final, final line. Words. The, mm. I think Anno spoke to the Japanese voice actress and said, you know, this this is the intention for how you're supposed to say that. I think Tiffany Grant was was giving the given those directions as well, and uh, so yeah, that's just you know a, a way in Could which inside baseball. Yeah, a way in which potentially a dub can uh, just, you know be a little bit more 
um, advantageous than the subtitles. Mm. I made my point. Um, let's move on. So yeah, this this is all. Um, first shot of the angel, Ezekiel. First shot of the angel, and uh, this is all the UN in charge of uh, operations at this point. Mm. Uh, or, or sorry, not the not the UN, but the. Um, uh, oh yeah, it, it is. is it, it, isn't it? Because sorry, it they... is UN. yeah, but but the more military based. Um, yeah branch of the UN. The, they haven't seceded to nerve yet because basically everyone's working at cross purposes. The the military branch of the UN is trying to use conventional weapons. You've got you've got your bullets, you've got your bombs, you've got your N2 mines which are basically what if an atom bomb but bigger. Um and then it's like, well, none of that works. So, nerve try your robot things again. Let let's see how that goes. And uh, basically, this is just one giant long con job by Gendo. It all essentially isn't it is is yeah. even bamboozling say like with uh with ulterior motives but um but yeah this is all just a, a power play bit by bit to make sure that more and more authority is given to to nerve for, for all these operations and uh and and key instrumental things such as when the american branch explodes sabotage more than likely um but it does ensure that certain pieces are moved around the board yeah um so Gendel Gendo will appear in a moment or two in the um, in the film, uh, but yet yeah, this is a really I mean I, as we say this is shot for shot from the series, but it's it's mm. it's so effective because you feel how um, this this monster that we don't know yet just looks unbeatable. It has mm. nukes dropped on it, and there's just nothing. Nothing happens. It's just blowing all these uh, ships out of the sky, and um, it's very uh, how it's portrayed as well. With with Shinji just being caught in the middle of it, and it, you just get this feeling of utter terror of just being caught in that. Not only has he got this stupid uh, monster to worry about, but then he's got the uh, you know the the uh, helicopters falling out of the sky, and they're firing you know missiles and things, and it's a really um, anxious moment and then Misato all of a sudden pops out of that and it's all, injects his humor all of a sudden and we've been mm. pulled in so many different directions of what to expect and it it is such when you when you pull it to pieces it is the perfect opening for for something like this and mm. it's misleading for what we eventually get but <laughs> what it what it turns into but especially with it all cleaned up and stuff and uh, mm. and you know the way that the missiles are animated and the new sound design um it's 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 possibly one of my favorite intros to not anything just not just because of how iconic it is but for how it sets everything up so perfectly mm. um in, yeah. into this these situation. are the stakes yes this is our this is our first introduction to what we'll be dealing with and i love the indifference of of Seikiel as well um just it's it's almost not bothered by anything. It's just trying to get to where it needs to get, and you know all these bombs and mines and everything else are just they're in its way. You know, humans just ants to it. It's not even trying to attack um, the people around them. It's just it's like at the moment just shrugging off bombs, and and that's it. It's got a place to be, and it's almost um, I know I use the term a lot, but Lovecraftian. You know these these giant yeah. elder gods that just couldn't care less about the the pitiful ways of of men around them yeah it does we are immediately what we were talking about earlier the question does arise of how is this city still standing (laughs) (laughs) particularly after ramiel (laughs) yeah it's just uh, this this uh this giant beast of a monster is just walking throughout all the skyscraper buildings while explosions are going off and yet we cut to the very next scene and and all the buildings are still standing it's uh, it's a bit mad but we'll we'll try not to focus on that um. Yeah. So, uh, ba 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 Captain uh, Misato Katsuragi rescues Shinji and takes him to Nerve headquarters. We could talk about Misato for a bit while this scene's playing out. Yeah. Sure. Let me just. Uh, let me just. I'm switching from one summary to another because uh, they're a bit. Um... Oh no! None of them actually. Uh, cover the intervening periods between meeting Gendo. So yes, how about it, my my man? Oh, my first anime love. How how can you not absolutely love Masato? She's everything that sort of like a nineties. It, it, growing up in the nineties, you got characters like I don't know, uh, 
Doug's sister always sort of like springs to mind, but like the too cool for school older sister um, sort of character. And Masato's just she's she's fun. She's just she's a really fun character. She's ridiculously sort of hypersexualized, but not in a sort of um, it is fan service, but it's almost playing up to fan service mm. um, sort of way. Um, she's just so much fun, particularly in the first half of the film. You know, she she like you say, she's got an edge to her that comes out in the second half but as an introduction to her character the moment she pops up i was like i want to see more of this <laughs> <laughs> she is an absolute delight whenever she's on screen yeah she is i agree um right down to the design as well just the the purple hair the black dress the the periodic braid the sunglasses the the car the car that seemed to be held together with with duct tape that she just happens to have and nothing phases her her car gets absolutely totaled and it's just like she she just dusts off her hands when they're done with it she tapes it up and they hit the road again she's she's not phased she's a really fascinating uh she's a such so as got a not schizophrenic but um hypocriticalness to or, like conflicting in every single um, way from. she's she's so carefree and um good humored and uh almost indifferent as you say to the state of a car being mm. um totally so close to being written off and yet she has so much power and authority um yeah. within nerve she is you know we've see her later and she's directing proceedings and things and it's really fascinating what they do throughout the entire film to um balance who misato is and um i was again i could be a, a bit critical but i just as to as to how they tell us how she got into that position uh, maybe I think maybe this series does a better job later on in the series. I can't remember yeah. how the movies deal with that, and and we find out that you know she's not, <clears throat> she didn't get to this position from being fun loving. She does have, you know, depth to her and qualities that make her right for this mm. role. Um, but there's not too much explanation in in this film as to it's like one minute she's Shinji's babysitter, and then the next she's overseeing operations, and she has the full trust of Gendo. Mm -hmm. And then she has to be the stern mother who has to safeguard the saviour of humanity. Yeah, so there is a little bit of a... Um, if, if you wanted to be ultra-critical, there's no moulding of those two as to how those mm. two sides for, you know, came to put her in this position. Uh, but we kind of go with it, I think. We are yeah. happy to go with it because she is in herself such a complicated character and pulled in all these different directions of she's trying to do what's right but she's trying to work within her position as well at times which is when she's hard on Shinji mm. and her own expectations and her own history and things um I was gonna say and that's perhaps um, one of the bigger detriments of of um needing to see the anime before the films because yes. um I I can't remember us getting any exploration into Masato I mean there's a lot to fit into the second film which is already clocking over two hours um and it, it feels like it's a case of well you know if you didn't do your homework and find out who she was beforehand then you know here's here's the basics yeah. um yeah so um yeah so something that is a bit lacking from the rebuild films Masata is just sort of there and uh, i would say that makes what happens in three even more jarring but i think regardless of of what we knew about the character you know fr from the rebuild films her treatment in the third film is just baffling um three is just jarring from top to bottom so let's just let's yeah. just put that there three, just, three, put three. A pin in it but yeah it, it just seems <laughs> a shame that uh, we never get to see more of the rebuild masato you know yeah. we we know she's complex and and there's more going on beneath the surface and we do get to see some of it with the events with uh, kaji in uh in the next film but we never get those those great scenes like in um a human works and hedgehog's dilemma and um uh, th those women long for the kiss of uh, the touch of a man on their lips or whatever it's called, you know, the, the real Misato focused episodes. Yeah. Um, Misato obviously was um, at the site of uh, Second Impact. In fact, we haven't even really spoken about Second Impact and stuff, have we? No, we haven't. That's that's quintessential. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to take the reins on that one? <laughs> um, you are the master of the law in these situations, so I'm going to leave it up to you. 
because okay, the, fair enough. The summary kind of glossed over it, so I'll let you. Um, go. So as we find out in what about episode twenty one of the show. Um, an archaeological dig, which included Masato's father when she was only about eight, are uh, digging for essentially proto-humans or, or signs of life in Antarctica. And they find it, and they unearth this um, this titan, essentially made of light, uh, which then wakes up, proceeds to decimate the planet in uh, in what's called the second impact. Because the first impact was Adam, the first angel, lands on Earth, boom, life is eradicated and new life rebuilds. da 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 Rewoken by... Misato's father, second impact caused, and that's where we are 15, 15 years later into this film. Uh, so yes, Misato was at Site Zero. She was saved by her father, and she resents the fact that he uh, loaded her into an escape pod and, and pretty much died in front of her eyes and then set her off to live, um, a traumatised orphan in, in, a, in an apocalyptic wasteland, essentially. So she's dealing with a lot of father and abandonment issues. Mm. And uh, and that all relates sort of directly into the third impact and how she met uh, Dr. Ritsuko Akagi. Uh, but the point is that she has a close personal reason for being in Nerve. And, mm. uh, you know, she... And hating the angels. Yeah, exactly. The, the, there is that motivation that um, uh, we don't really get to... See, and that's maybe one of the things that should have been introduced, I think, in, in this film. Mm. We, we, get, we get a lot of background information as we were talking about additional background information between how Nerve works and, and this, that, and the other. Um, that maybe, I think, it would, would have been good. That's maybe, especially considering that the film is so short, I don't yeah, think there would have been bit of law. any harm in making an additional 20 minutes and, you know, putting that in there, because that's, mm. all, that's all good stuff. That's all stuff we need to know. Um, so yeah, um, the UN military have just failed in blowing up the angels, and uh, <laughs> they turn to Gendo, and Gendo, Gendo's such a, he's such a dick, but he's such an amazing dick. Um, he's he's amazing. He <laughs> Voldemort wishes that he could be as despicable as Gendo. <laughs> he truly is one of the all-time loathsome cunts, and even when you understand his motivations and and reasons um even then you know they're always sort of suspect of what his background is and even if he did love shinji's mother he has always been in it for personal gain and uh, and glory but it in no way diminishes just how much of a fucking arsehole he is he he doesn't even revel in it that's the shame of it he doesn't even sort of like seem to take gleeful joy he is just this despondent callous emotionally manipulative for, for most of the women in the show and, mm. uh, and several of the, the men as well just just an all-round dick <laughs> he has one goal and um that is all he's interested in there is no sympathy there's no empathy he is just a man on a mission to um to be with his wife again essentially mm. is the is is the bottom line of, of what his his goal is um and he will see the entire planet burn to achieve it yeah yeah uh again this is the balancing act of how far into the law do we go it, it is all mm. integral to the conversation that we're currently having but you don't want to get too bogged down in 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 the future stuff while we're still trying to uh do the scene by scene yeah especially when we're an hour and a half in and we're only uh four, minutes the movie? four minutes into the movie <laughs> four minutes yeah we're gonna have to skip around a lot i think <laughs> <laughs> um but there is so much to discuss and uh and and uh yeah hopefully we'll still do that just as well well um, i love that i love the way she dusts off her hands when they flip the car sorry i, I had to say it when i saw it on the, no, uh, the please, screen no please such a nice little human moment <laughs> yeah i think that's what makes miss Otto so attractive as, as a character as well is she's the uh, I, I i dare say the only one she's the only extrovert in this movie She's the only yeah. one that that behaves enthusiastically, and um, um, with a positive attitude. And um, I, I mean, I wouldn't say she acts, she's the only one that acts like a human because <laughs> that's not true. But acts in a way that you maybe want someone that you're in the presence of to act. Yeah. Because she is um, comforting and disarming and seems sincere. And she has all those great qualities about her that makes mm. you, as the viewer, um, feel settled. All yeah. the while, 
all hell is breaking loose around you. And I think that's, um, that again is, is as, as a viewer, something that is conflicting later in the film where you, you put your trust and faith into this character as the only one who is looking out for Shinji. And mm. then is she actually, and there is that bit of a betrayal there. Um, as, as 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 the viewer to our feelings towards where she's she's actually as we were saying she's she's a bit harder around the edges than we than we give her credit for. Um, but let us crack on because we are. So yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, Misato's. We'll probably find that we sort of cover most of the main beats just through talking about it and can sort of oh, skip no. through it. Oh I, yeah, we spent twenty minutes. <laughs> I think we could make this a good seven eight hours if we wanted to. <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, Gendo. Oh, here's a bit of trivia for you. Sorry, um, no, that's fine. That's fine. Let me uh, let me just grab it. Um, so uh, Shinji's ID card number is NCC uh, colon one seven zero one A, which is for Star Trek fans the hull number on the Starship Enterprise in uh, Star Trek the movies four and six. That's very cool. I didn't know that. Yeah, that is excellent. Uh, trivia. So this is the part, as you were saying, um, that Gendo has been scheming all these years. It's been all leading up to this. Uh, the UN military branch are giving him control of the uh, the Angels incident. Really, he mm. he he now um, has full control of dealing with them. Um, Nerve have been. Uh, building these giant robots, and they're like, "Fine, use your giant robots and just mm. just kill it. Whatever you do, kill it yeah. with, with, with that desperate. Kill it with fire, and we don't even care. But we just assume they're robots. Use your robots. Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not the the horrible reality that is so wonderfully encapsulated uh, in uh, the test room scene later mm. on. Mm. Yeah, all the questionable." questionable morals of uh, of what's going on um and yeah we'll we'll touch on that later during the mm. uh, shinji scene i mean i went on a massive diatribe at the beginning but uh just reliving it now um i yeah it just hit me even harder about about how there's no consideration uh with these guys at all there's no empathy in in in, mm. in the slightest um i love the new effects that they've put into these scenes just just small little things but mm. uh how when shinji and misato are in the car and they're going down the like the escalator thing into nerve headquarters just the little ways in which this world is is built even more to look and feel like a, a mm. technologically advanced um city wonder. is just a wonder yeah is is, is great and um, the, the the bit that i really like it it's not really showcasing the wonder or anything but just in terms of just the the little details is when they're on sort of the um the escalator rocketing along at 100 miles an hour and they enter sort of like the big chamber uh, yes. the antechamber and the change in air pressure causes you know their hair to ruffle and the the map mm. to flap and i just really like that detail much like i like the detail um a few seconds behind on the screen of uh, the file that shinji was given uh, is so heavily redacted <laughs> that it might as well just be a black sheet of paper it's it's yeah. a wonderful detail it's like <laughs> shinji your file the calls you here are all the details you need and it's just basically shinji come here and that's that's all he can read um and another thing <laughs> that um is interesting to pick up on is as well is just how empty everywhere mm. is at the minute um that feeling of abandonment almost you've, you've got the people the people that are supposed to be dealing with this are dealing with it and everyone else is just hiding they're all yeah. they're all sheltered um away there is no middle ground here there's no um scurrying of of you know from from one place to another this this is uh shinji and misato are the only people voluntarily entering this this situation this this mm. uh, this really um extreme situation where we find out later and again it's such a pivotal pivotal scene with lilith where misato's like uh actually you don't understand shinji by being down here we are essentially putting our 
lives on the line. If, if, if the angel gets down here, it blows up. And that's such a powerful moment because we don't know that at the minute. And, and as I say, there's so much pressure put on Shinji's shoulders and he thinks that he's the only one bearing it when um, in actuality, you know, entering um, this massive underground facility is in itself um, a bit of a, a Russian roulette. And uh, really? that's that's really powerful. And, and, and when you learn that, it adds so much more to this uh, emptiness that we feel at the minute because um yeah people don't want to be committing to <laughs> uh, yeah to, these things to to, to to being here it is serious it's it's serious shit but and then right down to sort of the emotional arm twisting it's mostly on genda but also on desperation the fact that they're willing to use child experiments it, they're willing to put children in danger yeah to get this done which is when we yeah. first meet ray um but yeah just little moments like that these vast empty cities where the only the only signs of life are those that are dealing with those that are trying to eradicate life and yeah. and everything else might as well not exist it's just getting in the way the structure of um of nerve headquarters is always i'm looking at it now and it's a bit easier with the uh frames being slower with mm. the pyramid and things but this kind of offshoot that's like a a pyramid Ooh. underground pyramid pool thing it's just, i can yeah. never get my head around it it's just a really interesting design but it's it's uh I, I, yeah it's always flummoxed me um they never really do anything with it even until no. uh, zerul enters the base in fact in the the next movie rather than the, the anime series where they actually go oh shit it's water mm, <laughs> there's, mm. there's a pool there yeah. um the bit that's always confused me is as well thought out oh this is a scene with a f um uh just where do they launch the evangelions from because if the <laughs> pyramid is nerve headquarters and the evangelions are in there then how are they firing them up into the air along the rail tracks yeah. it seems that like everything has been so well thought out but i would really like to see a map <laughs> much like masato's got there yeah yeah that's that's one of the things she says isn't it it's like i'm still new to this building and it's so hard to mm. navigate and again i just i just like the emptiness of it um it feels it feels as lonely as shinji feels i think at the minute i think yeah. that, that's what they're trying to do um, and it's a whole new level of loneliness as well, because it's <laughs> the world he lived in was so small by comparison, and now it's just got a lot larger and a lot more empty. Yeah, yeah. So th these are great scenes. It's not necessarily a moment of quiet per se, um, especially because this film does like to do quiet, lingering moments, and it does them really well. Um, mm -hmm. But it does allow us to uh, be in awe while still taking stock a little bit. Um, and yeah, these are... Um, these are all new scenes, essentially. I think aren't they? They they they're yeah. kind of expanding on things that are just the intimate place but, and yeah. start getting around. I, I love this little detail as well when Shinji fires that sort of question at her, and her eyes just darken. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really nice little touch. And there are lots of great moments like that. Mm. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, our first introduction to uh, Risk, and um, again. Uh, she's meeting Shinji for the first time and uh, Misato kind of um, takes responsibility for him almost and I think that's one of the things that she does from uh, the beginning is kind of say you know the, there is that there is that kinship there where she's where she wants to um, stand up for him and kind of uh, you know be his champion and be a supporter and um, mm. And that's 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 nice. But uh, Ritsuko, what's your opinion yeah, of Ritsuko in this film? Just about to ask you that, just in general, um, a, a combination of this film and um, the the first couple of episodes with her. I mean, sure, she's she's sort of cold and and scientific and indifferent, but I really like early uh, Doctor Ritsuko Akagi. Um, I think she's she's a likable enough character, and it's not until like all the characters as the series and. Not really the films, but definitely the series as as uh, the series goes on, that she becomes more three dimensional, but more unlikable, if mm. not detestable, for her actions, um, and and sort of I'm not going to use the term pathetic, but um, the, when we learn about her backstory, it, it sheds her in a, a whole new light. But un until that moment, I I really like Ritsuko. I think she's a nice counterbalance to Masato, who's sort of playful and. Um, sort of fly by the seat of her pants and ah, it'll be all right on the night and yeah. uh, grow a sense of humour. And Ritz goes like, no, we've got a job to do. Let's do it. Let's not be complete dicks about it. But, uh, you know, important stuff's going on. And, and there's a really nice balance between the two, particularly when we sort of see scenes of them in their downtime. Yeah. Uh, we get some later on in the film where they're just in a bar, just sort of chatting about life, the universe and everything and, uh, and sort of like 
the men we've got to contend with in this world. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I really like early Ritsko. Um, th- you'd be hard-pressed to find anyone that says, I don't sympathise with her, but it's hard to like her as, as it goes on. Yeah. Uh, Fiyutsuki as well is another uh, character we'll have to touch on at, at some point. Oh, I love Fiyutsuki. Uh He's not really given too much to do aside from, mm-hmm. in this film, aside from, you know, being... He looks a bit like Gendo's lab dog, but he is incredibly important to the story as a whole. So maybe we'll we'll touch on him in a little bit. Yeah, I will say he's the only character that walked away unscathed from three three three. I feel. Mm. I can't. I can't remember. It's been like ten years since I last watched it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see. Um, yes. Yeah, so we are uh, ten minutes in now. And uh, this is something I wanted to check with the series. Uh, it takes um, just over 15 minutes, I think, to get to this point in the first mm. episode. So this one really does whiz along. Um, chops off five minutes already while still expanding on other things. So it's, it, as, as I said earlier, it's really nicely paced. Um, there's no you know, fat or anything. Uh, mm. we, we, we get exactly what we got from the series and, and a little bit more. Um, so yeah, getting the robot Shinji. This is <laughs> that classic. scene, that classic scene. Um, so, uh, and also Shinji's um, first interaction with Gendo in uh, and our first and our first Sorry, view was... of, of Eva Unit One. E. Uh, I was just going to read the blur um, and those colours. Yeah, the colors. I mean, the the, the purples like and the pop. greens and the oranges in this film mm. just of, of the of Eva Unit One are sensational, and um, yeah, especially um, when the other tones are so um, muddy and, and mm. earthy, it, it looks incredible. Uh, but yet, my uh, synopsis isn't adding too much. So this is kind of this is the point that I was talking about earlier, where everything suddenly shifts for Shinji. And um, I, having already seen this and knowing the beats being brought back, I mean, I, I don't actually think I said the last time I saw this was uh, prior to the premiere of um, Evangelion 2, uh, which is what Matt and I did. We went to the premiere down in London for showing in the UK, which is very special. And so that was uh, like 12 years ago or something. Yeah, um, 2010, January 2010. And uh, so that was the last time I saw this. Um, I've still got the, uh, the what do you call it, the promo material. Yeah, me too, the game. me too, mm. me too. So this is the big moment. It's um, Gendo has abandoned Shinji his whole life. The last time he saw him was three years ago. And after telling him that he wanted to see him, uh, Shinji's worst fears have come true. And it turns out that he just wanted to use him all along. And again, we've been putting that situation of um, Shinji, again, why I have so much sympathy for him is he met Masato, and uh, you know there was no way he was going to trust Masato so easily. But she was giving so many vibes that that he could trust her, and that she was going to be different, and uh, and she had his best interests at heart. And then he meets Ritsuko, and Ritsuko's trying to, you know, say, ah, well, uh, Shinji, yeah, it's great to meet you, and that kind of thing, and. And then, as we say, we're ten minutes into the film. He's he's only been in Nerve headquarters a, a, a fraction of a second at this point, and now it's like, right, we have expectations of you. Do this, uh, mm. and if you if you don't do this, um, we're going to shout at you, and we're going to call you pathetic. And, uh, and then, if you still don't do it, then uh, then we're just going to tell you p- to piss off, and yeah. um, and then effectively murder a child before your eyes as well at the same time. Yeah, so. These people are monsters, <laughs> yeah. as, as we've said, um, and uh, I, I don't want to go into it again because I already went on that on that spiel. Mm. But it it for what for whatever reason, my eyes were really opened in this. And as much as you love the characters and 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 who they are as as personalities outside of their mm. positions, uh, this is brutal. It is brutal to watch them put a, a what do they say? Is is how old is 14? Shinji? Fourteen? A fourteen-year-old boy that has already suffered so many traumas in, um, in his life. If you if Shinji was a real boy, 
they just put him down at this point yeah. because there's only so much mental torment a child can go through. He he's broken, man. He's well, we got to save that for the for the meeting of Bardriel in uh, episode thirteen. <laughs> <laughs> That's when Shinji truly does break. Yeah, and um, mm. and they put so much pressure on him, and um, uh, and, and we'll get to it later. But I I do enjoy how he starts to uh, he. he he tries to do what they want of him eventually. And he just realizes I'll just do what I'm told and yeah. my life doesn't really matter. Um, I just want this approval. I just want this mm. acceptance. And if I just shut up and do as I, I'm told, then I'll get that. And, and that doesn't even work out. And Exactly. Yeah. It becomes his mantra, doesn't it? Just, uh, what is it? Uh, aim the sights and pull the trigger, aim the sights and pull the trigger, aim the sights and pull And this just is so robotic and detached from it all. Yeah. And as you say, he, he does it and it, it screws up because the, the plan isn't as simple as just pointing and pulling the trigger. And then suddenly everyone's on his case again. And then he's got other things to contend with. And yeah, just the, the amount of, of stress and emotional abuse that's placed onto the poor kid. It's no wonder that he's bored like catatonic. And this and this is where this all begins. And as well, you've got this amazing shot of, of Gendo. Again, another icon. Mm. This, I mean, this was all in the first episode and you've got so many iconic shots all, all within the first episode. Uh, Gendo up here in this, you know, being silhouetted by the bright orange light, he's got this. He's a godlike figure almost. Um, that Shinji, Actually, the Shinji. The, mm. that Shinji is both literally looking up to and metaphorically looking up to. All all he's ever wanted was uh, was the approval of his dad, who's ignored him, and here he is looking down at him, expecting something of him, wanting something for him, and and when he shows the first signs of not being able to do that, his dad discards him, and he says, "Right, we'll get out." Oh, well, his his exact lines are he he pulls up um, Futsuki on the screen and goes, um, oh, hang on, I've I've got the line. Uh, it's something like, um, we can't use the spare. Get Ray. It's just, yeah. Just oh, the 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 cruel coldness of it. Just yeah. we can't use my son. We can't use him. No, just he doesn't even assign him a him a gender. It's just the spare. Mm. Again, Voldemort showed as much compassion to Cedric Diggory. <laughs> <laughs> now this is coming from the boy's father. It's incredible. It's um it's it's devastating and it's brutal and um you just yeah, again, you as the audience are pulled into so much conflicting um uh directions because you're aware of the situation that they're all facing but horrified by how they're going about it with just They've, they've, they've lost all their human. They're, they're trying to save humanity, and they've lost all mm. their humanity. That's the that's the real crux of what's going on here. Um, Out of it, I, I don't know about you, but uh, Team Four Star have utterly ruined this scene for me with Gendo's master plan in a monologue. It's like I've got it, Shinji. Get in the giant robot. No, shit. <laughs> okay, I need a new plan. Got it, Shinji. Get in the giant robot now. No, fuck. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's amazing. Oh, it's <laughs> it is good. Oh, from all these years ago. Um, and uh, like you say, so um, they're all trying to beat down on Shinji, and then uh, Gendo's like, "Well, bring in the other pilot." <laughs> and the, and the doesn't other... he actually? Na he, he names Ray. He names Ray, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. he names Ray, but his own child is the spare. Yeah, and uh, and they they wheel. <laughs> wheel rain <laughs> it's so brutal it's, again yeah. it's just the um you have to laugh i don't know again i don't know if if that is part of uh gendo's uh plan is to just be like well i'm gonna guilt this kid into getting in this stupid robot or if it's just he's th this is just how it happens they're wheeling uh, i think Ray. it's just how it happens it's just how it happens and, and ray's um like just can't even walk she's bandaged mm. and she's bleeding and she's uh just in pieces essentially um and they wheel her by him and and he's like well now i feel bad <laughs> mm. i'll get in the robot and, and, and no one else says it, it does anyone else kick up a stink akagi doesn't say anything about well you know she's her arm's hanging off yeah. <laughs> it's just like okay well we can't use shinji yeah Might as well try Ray. and um Again, it's it's that uh, that thing of 
that they've all lost their humanity and, and Shinji, despite all of this, um, like, despite in a meta way all the shit he gets, he's still the only one with a conscience in this situation. Yeah. Despite how broken he is and saying, no, I'm not getting in the robot, he can still see and feel the responsibility that I need to do this. I need to protect this mm. this girl. I need yeah. to. Where no oh, one else will. Gendo's this... smiling, Ray's on the floor. Yeah. He's, he's totally planned this. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I forgot I guess the so. shot. Yeah. I, I, sometimes you just think it's like uh, a child in pain. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> this, this fuels my gendo <laughs> But looking... yeah, Shin, no one else runs over to help Ray. You know, Shinji's a complete stranger. These are like the, the her essential surrogate parents, mm. and, and no one's even lifting a finger to help her. But Shinji, just this complete stranger, is in pain and need and not only does he run over to comfort her he then agrees to get in the damn robot <laughs> he does and and again this is why it bothers me that shinji gets so much shit because there is so much humanity in him that that isn't recognized just because he's a 14 year old boy that's been asked to do all this nonsense <laughs> um so uh gendo then pressures uh yeah gendo then pressures shinji into piloting over unit one against the angel uh, as the other pilot, Rei Ayanami, is too injured to do so. Shinji initially refuses out of fear, but upon seeing Rei wrapped in bandages and carried in on a stretcher, he reluctantly agrees. Uh, you know what? This this synopsis is, is bold. Yeah, it's a we bit can, more than that. Yeah, we, we can. <laughs> it's seeing we can do it better. Struggling ourselves. to fight down the pain as she's tossed from a gurney that uh, that really does it. Yeah, I, we know the story well enough. Uh, thank you, synopsis, yeah. but no thanks. We can take it from here. <laughs> um, yeah, so he gets in the robot. And um, uh, LCL has always been a bit of a, um, I don't know if I call it a phobia, but it freaks me out. And I wish that they've... Inhaling liquid. Inhaling liquid. And I think Mm. that's something that is um, covered more in the series, and it's not really covered as much in here. But Mm. I think that's something I would have really liked them to have touched upon a little bit more just that just that claustrophobia yeah. and the, and the fear of you know having this capsule filled with liquid and and being like i'm gonna drown i'm gonna drown and then they say oh no it's okay you can you can yeah inhale. and then he just so, does yeah whereas even when uh toji and uh God, i always forget the name of the other guy uh Ken's when they scared. climb in Ken's yeah it's good they, they just sort of go oh right, i'm in there um, yeah 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 Whereas it's because um, everything in evangelion is symbolic and has meaning uh it's uh it's amniotic fluid essentially isn't it well, literally, it is literally amniotic <laughs> fluid. They just call it LCL. <laughs> yeah. Um, yep. Gets in the robot. We're 15 minutes in. He gets in the robot, which, again, is quite uh, relevant to the show. Mm-hmm. And uh, and they just fire him off. He's had no training. He's had no... Uh, he didn't even... You know, he didn't even know uh, what any of this stuff was, literally, five yeah. minutes ago. And now he's in a robot. And he's... Fighting for his breathing life. water, <laughs> breathing water, and fighting for his life, and uh, let's say again, these and are still all... getting shit for it. Yeah, I don't know if it's just my age where where you pick up on these things, but it's just it's just barbaric, man. Um, Shinji, go up onto the surface. You've never, had... especially when you see how much training is required to mm. pilot an Eva, and they go into into this more in in the show. I don't think they touch on it. They certainly don't in this film can't remember if they do in the second film but there's a lot to do with sinking with the mm. evangelion and, yeah the um, sinking you deep into the plug the the sort of deep of the bond yeah mm. and so there's all that kind of thing and you've only got these two little handrail things to maneuver the entire thing so it's like what do they expect him to do <laughs> um and they i was watching this thinking it reminds me of the goat from Jurassic Park, where they just put the, the mm. goat in the T Rex pen to to try and see what happens. It's like, yeah, I don't feel that they're doing this as a last resort. Um, I and you always had no, no, no. You carry on, sorry. No, I was, I was just going to say they can't have any expectations that this is going to go down uh, That's in, in, exactly. a, in a positive. They, if if I'm in this situation, this is um, the hail mary's of all the hail mary's <laughs> and they are fully expecting this kid to get blown to shreds mm. um but no one is willing to acknowledge that yeah this is purely an experiment a bit of a, a tricky one because you know the, the angels on the doorstep but um it's a case of i mean do we want to go into what the evangelians are and raise sort of connection and Shinji's connection yeah. to them at this point yeah, or? Do it. Yeah. um so yeah basically uh the 
Evangelion mass-produced units that Gendo is uh, is growing are clones of his his dead wife. That old and chestnut. so in a chestnut. Um, so Ray is also a clone of his dead wife. So they've tried putting a clone of his dead wife into a gigantic clone of his dead wife to see if they'll sort of sync up because it's all based on like synchronicity. Um, and as we'll see later, that doesn't go so well and leads to Ray's injuries. And so it's like, okay, right, shit. Doesn't quite work with person on person. What if we try with mother and son? Um, and it, it works. And later on in the film, they confirm, oh, brilliant. Right, in that case, we've got a German model with a similar situation going on, which we don't even find out till end of Evangelion is a situation, which is just like, ah. Um, but uh, yeah, it, this is the case of a mother lifting up a car to save her child in the most Freudian, weird Japanese sci-fi rendition possible. Mm. Uh, and yeah, it, it does feel like, oh shit, okay, we've got to rely on Shinji for this one. We know that we can probably still get the German model to work, but this is really testing out if our theories hold any water whatsoever. Yeah. They have no expectation on Shinji winning or even surviving this, but it's like, oh, maybe it'll give us enough time to to sort of just tread water until we can really you know find out how to do what we need to do but shinji just gets lucky <laughs> he does because he gets absolutely brutalized the uh the angel destroys him um he, he uh, and and another thing as well in this is um shinji feels all the effects that yeah. uh the, the evangelion feels um if as we see he the angel grabs him by the head and starts firing these laser beams into into its face and Shinji feels mm. that in his eye and then it grabs hold of its arm and he snaps his arm it's again it's another thing of you've put this 14 year old kid into this situation and you're torturing him and um as as, as you would expect he um uh he just can't handle this situation because how can he and um and then like you say it's it's the 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 mother uh, from within the Evangelion, who the Evangelion is, you know, uh, what would you use? <laughs> engineered from. Engineered from, that's that's a good phrase. Um, can sense what's happening and, and goes goes solo, goes rogue, goes yeah. renegade, goes berserk, as, 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 as they call it. And yeah. it's, um, we don't know all this at this point, of mm. course, because there's still all that uh, conspiracy to be unveiled, but... Um, yeah, but so. it's it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because the um, uh, Unit Zero, who we'll see later, Ray's uh, robot has essentially, when it awakens, it has an existential crisis mm. and tries to kill itself and everyone around it. Um, whereas when Unit One awakens, it's because her child's in danger and it causes her to go into full-on berserk mode. And that's sort of like the that's the moment Gendo knows, holy shit, this could work. Yeah. This this whole thing could play out. <laughs> the depth to um, how things play out is incredible, and again, it only takes. It, it, you need a full watch, and maybe even mm. two or three more re rewatches to even understand. You know, oh, it's so tense. The complexities <laughs> to which this uh, this abomination of a situation has been concocted. It's amazing. <laughs> um, so yeah, everyone within Nerve is like freaking out, uh, even though they must surely ex expect what's going to happen, and um. And then the Evangelion um, wakes up, and do you know what my favourite part of this entire uh, scene is? Uh, for me, it's the bellow. Oh, no. I, I do. I love the bellow. I, I do agree with that. I think I've skipped past it. Uh, it'll be too much effort to go back. It'll. It's once the uh, Eva goes berserk, and all the nerve staff are like, oh, it's gone berserk, it's gone rogue. And then Fiyutsuki just says, we've won. And yeah. that's... And Gendo oh, smiling. And Gendo, that's one of my favourite moments in all of yeah. Evangelion. It's, it's so good. It is so good. Um, <laughs> again, because it just shows how so far deeper into this conspiracy they are than everyone else. Mm. They know so much more because uh, they've concocted it, of course. And um, But it's just... Oh, it's, it's there. It's this bit. Um, mm. uh, yeah, we've won, and he, he says it with a with a straight face, and it's just sums up how in control of this situation they are. Mm. Even though things look uh, at its bleakest, 
at the point that they they just know yeah their their robots gone rogue their child has been horrifically maimed this thing is right on top of them and it's like yeah in the bag yeah uh (laughs) the um the actual fight between the uh unit one and the uh sorry um take you uh Sekiel. Sekiel, yeah. yeah. Uh, but maybe out on the pronunciation, but uh, Sekiel. Sekiel's fine. Um, it's really intense as well, as it's starting to rip open the AT field. And there's a great job done with the uh, dialogue, as well as Misato and Risco and everyone else are just absorbed by what's happening and, and struggle to understand uh, what they're seeing before their eyes. And it's like, no, he's not um, uh, ripping apart the AT, f- AT field. He's dissolving it. Um, and uh, the the arm regenerates, of course, and then there's just uh, from the angel brutalizing the Eva, it then mm. flips on its head. But the angel just uh, the the Eva goes uh, savage so much further, so mm. much further than what the angel does, and uh, starts just breaking it to pieces, and then hammering it with its own uh, like little. Um, yeah, it rips out one of its rib, ribs rib and cage. Then stabs its own, essentially the heart, the core of the angel, yeah. just smashing it in. It is, it is a brutal, barbaric, savage display. Um, and again, it, it, it's so interesting to compare it with the complete indifference and the blankness of Sekiel, who's doing things very matter of factly in, in all of his actions, very like smooth and calculated and everything else. It's like uh, the T one thousand versus a T eight hundred sort of situation. Mm. Um, and the, I mean, it, it was effective in the original series, but the new animation and stuff just, it just brings it to a whole new mm. level. Um, and then Sekiel, um, self-destructs, essentially. It's like, well, crap, I'm not getting out of this situation, so I'm going to try and take both of us, um, out at the, the, at the same time. Mm. And, uh, and explodes, and, uh, but doesn't work, obviously. Uh, and yeah, that's, um, that's the end of the first angel and it's introduced, it's, it's, it's interesting how they deal with the episode cuts in this film. I, really I was, don't... I was going to say, yeah, cause Kids. the first episode ends with pretty much Shinji being pummeled and like his, that still image shot of his face with Technicolor and then it's just like to be continued and then mm. next episode picks up in the aftermath and then we sort of track back into the fight. Yeah. Um, God, what an image. Yeah. <laughs> I, how everyone's shocked and just in awe and, oh, it's so good. Um, but this is good because they take that intensity of um, of what's just happened and then just stop. And we'll see it in a second. It feels like the end of an episode, really. Mm. And we are, what, 22 minutes 20 in? minutes in? 20 minutes in. So uh, we are pretty much at that point. And <laughs> Kendo again. It's <laughs> such a dick. Um, <laughs> and uh, and then it just, as I say, you've got this intensity, and then what would usually be the end of an episode, it just stops and slows down, mm. and um, and uh, we get this scene. Oh, oh, I've I've just remembered before we sort of move into the scene itself. Is it uh, the halfway point through episode two when we cut to Shinji and? Um... It's very difficult to explain sort of how they see through the Eva's eyes, isn't it? But effectively, he catches a glimpse because the Evangelion's been blown up, you know, so walking away from the explosion. And he catches sight of the Evangelion in a reflection in one of the skyscrapers. And it's just this horrific, bandaged, bulging eye staring back at him. And just one of the most famous things about this series is Shinji's screams of absolute nightmarish horror and then that then cuts to to black with like <laughs> evangelion will be back in part two yeah. well just this scream is lingering in the air first of many oh shinji's screams bone chilling stuff <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so they they break everything apart with this train scene and they go um introspectively into shinji and there are two of these and i'm having trouble remembering what they talk about in this one do you remember uh, th- this is a new scene. Uh, this is Gendo mm. saying if it's um, a boy. Oh, wait, no, that's the second <laughs> yes. one. So this one's just uh, Ray saying uh, Shinji, Ray, I anime Shinji, Ray, and then wrong. And then she just gets weird and floopy and flies at the camera. And then Shinji wakes up in the hospital. Mm. 
so she can smell something's not right. Yeah. Um, very effective. Ba -ba 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 -ba. And then we see our first shots of Zele. Uh, Shinji. Wait, should we talk about the Zele thing? They just... Yeah, let's do. Yeah, you're the you're the guy for this, so I'm just going to leave you to it. Um, so Sele are a organization of essentially, um, they're a doomsday cult, essentially, and they're trying to engineer, um, I, I forget exactly what their ends are, but they have the Dead Sea Scrolls and a bunch of other sort of religious paraphernalia that all relates into Adam, the Third Impact and everything else. And I think from memory, they want to use the Third Impact for their own ends. Human to... Instrumentality Project. Yeah, the, the Human Instrumentology Project, where basically everyone is turned into ambiotic fluid. We're all together as one amorphous entity, and there is no pain or suffering, only only one eternal everything. And Gena's like, no, nah, fuck that, I want my wife back. <laughs> so um, he's he's using Sele's, like power and influence and, uh, and access to see their plan to a certain point but then he can then sort of supersede it with uh, with his know-how and, and owned endgame yeah. and i mean they suspect him of of not quite playing ball but because you know everyone's playing each other he's like well he's a tool but he's a useful tool and they don't know that he's already like three steps ahead of them in his chess game um so yeah they're just a super shady secret organization that are trying to they're trying to bring about the end of the world but for the best of situations they're mostly a bunch of cripples and aristocrats yeah. and uh and malformed individuals that are sort of alive through technology more than anything else yeah it's it's their uh personal vision of being able to have um infinite life really isn't it they mm. uh, it's just as in i suppose in like um the spiritual aspects of what consciousness is that's what they're aiming for it's to mm. it's to just ex 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 experience um uh consciousness but as like this liquid as you say is is, is this uh, it's within the lcl isn't it is, isn't that uh, yeah it's literally lcl fluid which LCL. is uh lilith's sort of blood and amniotic fluid because mm. we are well we <laughs> humanity is born of lilith humanity is the 17th angel or 15th i think they've they reduced the number of angels in this rebuild saga um but uh yeah it's like re rejoin the great mother and uh, and all be as one and uh they're essentially I suppose you could look at it as a um, New World Order. Um, um, God, my brain keeps saying Anunnaki. It's not the Anunnaki. It's their, their alien species. Uh, um, Shiriku? No, no, no. Just the... Um, what's the ultimate uh, conspiracy theory ruling the world cult? Uh, Bilderberg? No, uh, no, no. What's the, what's the generalized name for them? I can't remember. I the Illuminati. The Illuminati, thank you. They're, oh, they're, okay. they're essentially like the Illuminati group, aren't they? They, they, they um, seem to have, they must have power and they must have influence oh, yeah. and, and wealth. And um, Gendo uh, is is their man within the highest of organisations mm. and they're leaving Which him. also irks them because he's sort of an underdog that's worked his way up from the ground, whereas they're very much born to rule yeah. and he's just this mongrel pop that managed to get lucky and sort of marry into like one of the up-and-coming scientists he did love her sure but uh, there was always sort of an element of personal gain in, in what he was doing and he's he's very much looked down upon even though he's very useful to them mm, mm. um yep so shinji's out of bed and uh um exploring the hospital and all that kind of thing um is this so? I can't remember if this is a new scene, but it's definitely embellished the after effects of um, mm. of, of, of the angel attack. And again, we're, we're seeing even more of the red uh, blood, water, blooded, whatever you want to call it. Is it just water that's red, or oh, it's it, got to be blood, surely. Um, <laughs> Considering where it came from, if an Evangelion is sort of linked into things. Yeah. So again, this is what I was talking about earlier that I liked. Um, just making this feel like a more lived-in world uh, mm. where we, we are seeing the after effects of these attacks and, and what they mean. And again, just a slight criticism, but it's something that you can't really go into because it would just destroy um, the realism of it is just how mm -hmm. things are <clears throat> rebuilt so quickly and so easily. Mm. Uh, like how, you know, uh, either one is... Um, 
uh, or should I, should I should say either zero is so uh, built up so quickly you, you think well how many <laughs> how much money does this place have and who's working on it and all that kind of thing but uh, anyway that's a it's very thing. difficult to get a sense of time from the it movie is. in the series isn't mm. it i don't know whether it, i assume it's taken place over a series of month uh weeks at the very least mm. um if not months but um, I, I assume that this movie's over the period of within a month yeah. seems reasonable enough yeah. um one brief aside is uh, one of my favorite moments from the show itself is where um <laughs> they take down is it uh, another angel another angel explodes and you see sort of the the big topographical map of future there's craters everywhere it just goes oh we're gonna have to redraw the map again <laughs> every time they have a fight they create new lakes and valleys and crevices like oh for god's sake the yeah. topography's all off again <laughs> <That's> <laughs> such a great moment yeah i'm glad you brought that up yeah <laughs> um yeah so shinji's just trying to come to terms with what's happened essentially mm. and um uh misato approaches him and uh, uh da, 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 what happens in this conversation between shinji and misato is this where she starts to get stern with him because he's been a bit pathetic no i think she's uh sh- I think she's on the brisk, uh, the brink of doing it, but then she sees how sort of like subdued and quiet he is, and it's like, come on, let's uh, let's take you home. Right. Okay. Let's, sorry, let's I'm thinking. I'm thinking further into the. Thing. Yeah, it's it's um, after Sam Shell that she uh, she flips out. <laughs> yeah. So this is um, Shinji's living. She she essentially just picks him up from the hospital and uh, says, right. So what are we doing with him? And uh, we find out that he's going to go and live by himself. And Shinji's like, well, that's fine. Um, but this is a great shot, actually. I'm just going to say that where they stood above the nerve complex and it's just i i imagine it's glass below them it might be a, uh, a special effect of some kind but um if i assume it is glass yeah if, if that is the glass that's just an amazing shot whoever had that idea of of um of just looking down on the nerve headquarters it's phenomenal mm. Well, again, it sums it all up, doesn't it? It's like even in in this new age, to situate their offices looking down upon their new creation. Mm. Again, theology and and religious iconography is just scattered throughout this show. Yeah. Um, And, yeah, as you were saying, this is another part of just a a slight twist to Shinji where he's like, he has a smile on his face. It's okay. I've I've lived by myself. I know what I'm doing. It's all right. And then the next scene is Ritzko saying, you're doing phone. what? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great little scene. Oh. And, uh, and Miss Arta's trying to play it down, saying, well, I won't, you know, I won't touch the kid and stuff. And uh, which... <laughs> I should hope not. Just like, Jesus, take a joke, woman. <laughs> <laughs> I love the interaction between these two. So it's, it's a shame that Ritzko is such a, a monster. Um, but... Uh, yeah, the interplay between them is is really good fun in this. The framing of these scenes as well is so masterful. When you, talk, I mean, that's kind of one of my favorite things. Um, when you look at f- filmmakers like Kubrick and uh, and even Wes Anderson, someone like Wes Anderson, it's how they place people within their scenes and 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 the shots they make. And this is another one that Anno is is so fantastic at with. Um, Misato on the phone up close to the camera, and then Shinji stood right at the back and he's just stood and he's just doing what he's told he he has no interest he's not reading anything he's not he's not you know taking interest in in the signs or anything about the facility he's just stood he's doing exactly as he's told um he's expressionless he's brainless he is doesn't know what to think anymore he doesn't know what to feel meanwhile misato is going through whatever she's going through and there's so much of a mm. contrast there between them there's so much within this little scene of of, of, of how it's framed to to show the relationship between them and the relationship that develops especially not even that it's the fact that you know this this is a conversation concerning him and his yeah. life and he is not a part of it he is he is over there so yes. the adults can talk and micromanage his life for him best intentions in heart but he still has no say in it he was happy living alone she's like nah this is what you should be doing i will control your life i'll do it with a smile but you do as your adults say yeah well said well said um well expanded upon uh yeah and so um misato uh begins to adopt shinji into her life and uh she takes him to the supermarket and these are all the these are all the really good little bits of evangelion that that 
just make it stand out, I think, so much mm. from, from other shows where they go to this supermarket and, and there are two women discussing um, what's happened. And um, uh, is this where they're saying uh, 100 people have, have left uh, just yesterday? Yeah. Is that that conversation? And they were useless. They did never absolutely useless. nothing. They, yeah. yeah. And, and Shinji's taking it all personally and taking it to mm. heart that, uh, that, that all these people are unhappy with what he's done. He he yeah. put himself out there and, and risked his life, and and still he's getting shit for it from random people that aren't saying, "Oh, thank God that angel was destroyed." It's like, mm. yeah, people are leaving, and um, and we, without without saying safe? a word, we're just from the you know the expressions of of Shinji and Masato, we know exactly what she's thinking. We know what he's thinking, and you know she doesn't say, "Oh, Shinji, you shouldn't take it to heart." Instead, she drives him to to overlook the city and just goes, "You know, this is." This is the future of humanity. This is what we're doing it for. They don't have to have any exposition dumps or, let's say, our feelings out loud sort of situations. Mm, it's it's really great storytelling, mm. um, visual uh, storytelling telling of, of, of show don't tell. Um, and again, so much personality and, and charisma in, in the choice of shots where Shinji's just sat with this big bag of goodies and it <laughs> says so much about Misato's mindset. Of, mm. you know she's not healthy she doesn't um she's not the type of person to cook she's not the type of person to take any interest in um his health from a nutrition standpoint it's like no we're gonna have a slumber party we're gonna we're gonna yeah. let loose and we're gonna be it's fun you're a kid act like a kid yeah it's fun <laughs> yeah which which is how she's lived a life all these years she's just despises responsibility and um but again, because she didn't have Pers uh, personal. I don't know how. Was she six or eight? She was young when she she, young. she lost her parents and was flung into the the apocalyptic wastelands. But uh, yeah, she doesn't know how to be an adult. Really, she's still in the series as well. She's very introvert until she meets Risco, and then Risco says, "Then she never shut up." It was like she'd been bottling up fourteen years worth of conversation and saving it for right now, and now she won't stop. And yeah, she is trapped in Arrested Development. Yeah. And it's again, it's a conflict of who she is professionally and who she is personally. It's like mm. she puts so much effort into, um, into into being who she needs to be for a job that um, when it's personal time, she's just there's no just... consideration there for anything. There's no consideration mm. for washing, tidying, um, you know, eating well, drinking well, um, and it's um, yeah. You you look at it as fun. Um, Especially when it's soundtracked as as it is with such a fun uh, theme theme that she has, um, but there's a lot of tragedy there as well, and we we see that obviously. Well, we see in the series we see that later of of yeah. what this has all come towards. But um, yeah, just so brilliantly realised to little conflicting idiosyncrasies, and and yeah, this is the scene that you were saying of this is what we fight for. As Tokyo Three after the angel attack, all the um, uh, uh, blah, 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 the uh, the skyscrapers start to appear again out of, out of the floor. Now that everything's safe, and it's a it's just ridiculous if you dive into that concept as we were doing <laughs> earlier. But hell with it. Let's uh, let's enjoy it for what it is, and yeah. it's it's really cool. And um, I love especially later on in the film uh, where it's like they've thought of everything where they have. The, um, in the third angel battle where uh, they like blow the uh um blow the, the entire the, block the, isn't it yeah and, and they just explode it's like there's nothing they haven't thought of in this situation it's all the little technical details like you the, the lavish attention to detail they show in how these things work it's like okay right so a skyscraper is rising from the earth how do we sort of like get around this on the science thing i know a meticulous shot of all the dead bolts locking into mm. place around it and and clasping into place and securing themselves and um they didn't need to do that whatsoever because we're already you know giant robots angel aliens and cities rising out of the ground but it's sort of the uh, the the slavish attention to techno details and techno babble in this film and, yeah. and series in general that really set it apart yeah yeah i agree it's very good um right so yeah that's that's a great scene as well and and and, and again Another instance of just every frame in this in this film could be a uh, a still for your wallpaper on your uh, on your PC laptop whatever it just looks great. Um, 
Doop -doop -doop. Yep. So this is a really adorable scene as well, where uh, Shinji, uh, where Misato brings Shinji home, and uh, and th all the Japanese customs come into play, and Shinji's like, "Excuse the intrusion," and Misato says, "No, this is your home now. This, you know, you we share this place." And and he says, uh, "Tadaima, I think, which is um, I'm home." And, I'm home. And she uh, replies back She's with, like, "Welcome back. Well, welcome home." And yeah, it's, it's uh, really sweet. Yeah, it is. It's really sweet. Um, and again, just so many little. That's 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 something that you can't really get away with in Western shows because we don't have those little customs, mm, little customs. Things. But mm. um, they're really used to great effect in Evangelion, and uh, it's touching. Uh, I love scenes like this as well. This is something I noticed when I was watching it. I, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but just how they frame um, coming home. And they take a shot of outside the building and just a light comes on. And mm. I don't think that that's anything that we really see much in the West. I, I might no, be wrong, right. but just, I just, the contextualizing the, um, the scene, uh, I just love it. I think there's mm. there's so many little things like that in Japanese animation that's that's outside the box compared to what we do in the in the West and it's really really special. Uh, but yeah, as as we were saying, Masato's uh, room is an absolute shit tip because she just <laughs> outside of a job she can't take responsibility for anything. Yeah, she's like, I only just moved in here like the other week or something, but it's like, well, <laughs> nothing's unpacked, but there's piles of garbage everywhere. Yeah. Um, and this is where we hear Masato's theme for the first time. And uh, uh, it's so buoyant and peppy and bouncy. Yeah. It's a shame that no one can hear it. You just just imagine something really upbeat and perky, and that's pretty much the theme. <laughs> Let's sing it for them. <laughs> okay, that's enough. Um, it's it's sort of like the um, you know the. How would I sum it up? A, a factory scene in a Warner Brothers cartoon. The dun 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 dun. <laughs> It's sort of like the I've come home and having a fun time equivalent to that. You know, I, I okay. equivocate it to sort of just shitting, uh, sit, sitting around and just enjoying company and food and, and drink with people. And it's like, ah, oh, that's my other theme. It's being home and comfortable. Yeah, it is. It is. It's the definition of a fun time. Uh, and so she's essentially trying to get Shinji to relax because uh, for some reason, you know, Shinji's still being Shinji, even though you change his environment. She seems to think that because she's adopted him into his home, he, he would let let loose a little more. And, and that's yeah, not the case. magically be a child now. <laughs> yeah, despite the fact that he's had nothing but uh, stress and and uh, and responsibility thrust upon his shoulders, it's uh, that that's an interesting thing I've just thought as as well is uh, how she has found herself adapting to the. You know the shifting responsibilities of of the responsibility at work, and then relieving that at home. And there's the impatience of of not understanding how he can't do that already. It's like, yeah. okay, you're home now. This is where you let loose, and and we do that by drinking beer and eating shit. Mm. And um, isn't this nice? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, goes... it reminds me of uh, South Park, the Imagination Land one, where you know there's Asl on the line is screaming at Butters to believe in Santa. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> He's got that vibe. Just got to relax. <laughs> I bet that comparison has never ever been made before, Matt. So congratulations, you've Yay, brought new something grand. new into the world. Um, <laughs> oh, the fan service! I just turned my head and it's like, ah, oh, there's Masada's ass. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was, I, I was going to bring that up. That's um. Uh, this series goes well into the fan service as well. I was going to say, mm. um. Especially in the second film with the plug suits, um, mm. because they make them near enough see through. Um, yeah, that's a bizarre choice. There's a lot of mm, questionable decisions about two. Yeah, this this film though it fully leans into the fan service, which was mm. there in the original series. It's it's worth saying, but I do think it's I'm not going to say it's done tastefully per se, but it's, it's done, harmless. It's harmless and it's done for a reason because they are showing um, Masato's carefree attitude. You know, she's got mm. this 14-year-old boy, but she doesn't think anything about wearing yeah. this skimpy top that's, you know, 
letting it hanging around by the table everything and... literally hanging out mm. um and i think that's the purpose of it as much as you know titillation or anything it's to mm. it's to just show Tell how... us something about the character yeah exactly yeah. um so I, I i don't see it as a you know a, a lewd cynical thing to do i think it's very much in a uh, in, in a character's perspective trying to trying to show that yeah and the contrast as well you've got shinji still sitting there in his shirt and and smart trousers essentially you know straight from school but also like dressing up to see dad sort of situation well, and here she is completely dressed down and that's a, a really interesting observation to make because shinji never changes his clothes in the entirety mm. of the uh movie aside from in his plug suit he arrives in that shirt and trousers he goes to school in that shirt and trousers he gets beaten up in that shirt and trousers. He sleeps on the streets in that shirt and trousers. It's it's a representation of where his mind's at. It's like he's frozen. He's 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 stuck. He's got no ability to explore himself and his personality because he doesn't know what that is. Um, and I think that <laughs> like bart simpson <laughs> um, <laughs> felt like i've been wearing the same yellow dress forever <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's it, it's interesting um i'd like to have been in the creative meeting where they were pitching that question you know do we change Shinji's clothes or is it or, or did they even realize did they even realize mm. that they were changing his clothes i mean i don't know um, this is another funny moment where Shinji's in the <laughs> bath and we get Pen Pen and he flies out and um, and uh, he's naked and um, Masato's totally cool. She, she's a bit shocked at yeah, first, just cool but then it's just, like, just what? plays along. And uh, <laughs> they add a, a bit of comedy where they take the um, can away and there's a smaller can. I remember the cinema erupting with laughter at that one. Yeah, that that was one of those moments that sticks with me. Just the whole cinema, just like, hey. <laughs> good sight gag joke. <laughs> it, um, Classic. It's Masada's face in this as well. Just like, yeah, what? <laughs> it's a fourteen-year-old boy standing in front of me. Well, why aren't you taking a bath? Oh yeah, the penguin. Here's a here's a history lesson, and then we never see Pen Pen again, apart from one shot at the end. Yeah, he feels really underused in this. He well, he always felt underused in the series, but. Uh, yeah, he, I, he briefly appears in the second film and throughout the series. Obviously, he doesn't appear in three, which is even more sort of disconcerting. But I have often wondered about what is the point of Pen Pen beyond, you know, he's a sort of smart hyper bird. And they never do anything with it at yeah, all. Well, yeah, I think that goes to show a lot about where the show was when it first started to what it became eventually. Um, and as we were saying, that the show does try to be playful in in a lot of ways, and and this uh, film, I think, wants to revel in that a bit more. Even though it doesn't mm. use pen pen again, it it does like with these side gags and things. It is a lot um, more aware of itself and happier to be, uh, you know, lean into the comedy of the first few episodes um, a little more. And I think pen pen, you can't not put pen pen in this film. So even though. Yeah. Even though there aren't any plans for him, he still needs to be that character because he's so yeah. integral to, you know, um, to the homeliness that Masato has, and and I think that's something she tries to say, isn't it? It's just, it's just he's part of the furniture. He's yeah. He's. Yeah. What would have been nice is um, if maybe he was part of the Antarctic expedition. You know, maybe like they were rare <laughs> eggs they found, but it was just Masato and an egg or the chick yeah. that was shipped out by by her dad. And you know, Pen Pen had always sort of been there. Um, I mean, given that he's a, a bird, it would have made sense. Uh, a penguin, it would have made sense. But uh, yeah, he just sort of turns up. And like you say, this show being written on the fly as it was, a case of just like, well, at the time he'd just be like one of the cute anime mascots, like in everything else. We've got our aliens and our dogs and everything else and uh, mm. we just have a penguin yeah um and there is the sight gag uh mm. i think they did this in the original didn't they but they didn't actually have the beer taking away i think that was kind of um the uh, like an expansion of the joke again a bit yeah. meta uh which is something that i really like uh, i think mm. that's that's really clever to inject something different while at the same time you know it's 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 um uh, what's the phrase that they use um, about expectations and things? Uh, subverting. Subverting it. You're, you're subverting the expectations of the audience. Mm. Where you think, oh, I've seen this before. And then they switch it up and it's like, oh, that was fun. 
Yeah, it's like the the fence hopping scene from the Three Flavored Cornetto trilogy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah, great reference. Um, I again, th- these films are so dense with psychological um, aspects and perspectives and things. I love how um, Misato says to Shinji that he should take a bath because that will help you wash away all of the stresses and strains of the day. And then Shinji is in the bath and he says, how can she say that? I think about all my, everything so much more when I'm... Yeah, I'm alone with my thoughts I'm, now. I'm this is the thoughts. worst possible situation. It's, again, it's just one of those small things mm. that shows the vast chasm between them as um, as, as personalities. And um, we get that great line as well about, uh, this is another ceiling I don't recognise, which is mm, like, uh, it's not about to the mm. hospital. It's just like, yeah, they, I'm, I'm not in my world anymore. This isn't comfortable i'm not settled here yeah um, but and, but it's like he's just accepted it now he's like another, yeah another yeah uh he he's he's just being pushed along by different people and he's become numb to the experience of it and this um i mean oh my god it's so it's so good you've got things like the hedgehog's dilemma which they they touch upon later and then you've got another uh, unrecognized ceiling and just these little aspects of psychology which are so you know deep with with what they represent and stuff it's it's so good and for the people that write this show off as just oh it's that sort of brooding emo goth show about whingy teenagers just embroiling in the misery of oh woe is me it's just that now there's so much more to it than that yeah oh, on a very superficial surface level sure it could be seen that but you're not really watching the show if that's what you're taking away from it yeah exactly and um you know all of the modern greats that deal with um equally intense psychological situations i think i don't know why my mind uh goes to code Geass, but you know all those shows have so much yeah. of evangelion in them puella uh madica magica mm-hmm. of course uh, the, the evangelion of the magic girl show genre yeah, yeah sure um, something as well I noticed from the bath scene is that again the water's red. Did you did you pick up on that? Oh no, I didn't. I don't yeah. know why it's all green. Um, it's probably from the show. I've I've got it, the anime series so emblazoned in my mind that I just pictured it as green. But I ah. I might be wrong, but I think every time we see water in this uh, in this film, it's it's red. Ah, wonderful. I I love this shot as well. Uh, just the the wide shot of Ritsuko and Gendo in the the smashed empty room. It's so hauntingly atmospheric and creepy. It's like everyone's dealing with the aftermath of this angel attack differently. They're mm. all, you know, going through different things. Shinji and Misato are obviously trying to uh, blow it off and, and and let loose, while as Gendo comes back to um, the failure almost. Mm. The, the, he's just more interested in Ray. Sure, Shinji's done what he's done, but he's not going to stick around and he's not, not going to praise him and he's not going to see him. Mm. He is so fascinated with ray and um that's his main focus with regards to how this all unfolds shinji's mm. just you know there whatever um and then you've got akagi who's a combination of uh it's sort of the uh, uh, her mother's quest for 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 knowledge and, and discovery and uh and proving her worth particularly in again like the, the field of men um and sort of setting herself as what is it like a a what are the three? There's a trifecta. There's the woman, the mother, and the lover. Like the three triangle that. Yeah, I think you might be right. Yeah. That it works on. Um, but then, the the Akagi women are just hopeless sort of slaves to Gendo's mm. just aura, and oh, she's such a an intriguingly pathetic character, despite it all. And mm. and it's a shame the films don't really go into it because it would have been something to, to really sort of go into and expand upon. But, um, yeah, it's very rare that you you don't see sort of Akagi tagging around with either Gendo or Misato sort of just working. She has no downtime at all in series nor film. It's just her life is her work and her passion. And it's not for enjoyment. It's to prove herself worth and prove herself to, to Gendo and her departed mother. It's just... Ah, it's so wonderfully rich and complex and deep and interesting. Yeah, and again, it's it's difficult to understand why they don't get into that more when they could easily have another twenty minutes of this of this film. Mm. Um, Shinji's um, music device um, <laughs> is a big. 
part of uh, this entire film as well. It's, it looks mm. old-fashioned by today's standards. You think that it was uh, when the show was first made in, in 95 and, and things were still very much on tape. But it has a, a weird sort of retro-futuristic vibe about it that, that, I've, that yeah. I've always loved. I've always thought it was great because uh, of how it's, it's sort of... Um, uh, designed in the same way that a CD would, but they're just tapes. So, you know, mm. there, is, there is this uh, idea that you can skip songs without just kind of fast-forwarding as, as as you would have done. <laughs> I mean, that's getting far too much into the technological side. Yeah, but still, it's, I've always found it interesting, particularly the way it's just sort of like clacks and clicks into place. And yeah. it always seems to just be repeating the same two songs back same and forward, back songs. and forward. Yeah. Mm. Again, just another one of those things that, in anything else would be a throwaway thing but it's so pivotal in this that shinji's mm. only uh, uh sorry water red again just something yeah yeah you're right you're right shinji literally stuck in life he's got those two tracks we only ever see the end of song 15 the beginning of 16 every single time we cut to it 25 26 uh f- 15 and 16 is sorry. it 15 and 16 i think it's 15 and 16 um sorry, but yeah well, whatever it is we only ever see like these yeah. two tracks and it's sort of between the two of them yeah and um it seems to be shinji has those headphones in and that's when he's alone almost um you 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 moving on me your laptop just went yeah sorry i said he nudged the uh the box (laughs) that it's sitting on all right um yeah so it's like that's when he zones out and he may as well not even be in the world anymore because he's not going to pay any attention to anything. And that's when he's at his most shinginess. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's when he's in that CD, uh, when, he's, when he's listening to, to that music. It mm. would be great if, um, if, if, if at some point... I mean, I love the mystery of it, but if there was... Could ever be a... Uh, like a, just an Easter egg outside of the series to hear what song he is listening to because that mm. is such a you, you can hear it ever so slightly yeah you can hear the wisps of it yeah um and but, it, it almost sounds like the sort of background music that you'd hear in your local polish exactly. supermarket corner store yeah 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 <laughs> and again that's so deep as well because it's not like he's listening to something sad or and depressing to match his mood it's it's like he's almost stuck um mm. in the uh just like he's, he's stuck on hold on a phone and that's what he's mm. listening to, is just that yeah. music. Um, which is so bizarre for the mental state he's in, but just adds to, again, the complexities of of what he is. And, um, yeah, I just love these shots of Shinji just being numb, essentially. Being in a state of existence. Yeah, and, uh, and then I think Miss Arta comes out of the bath and she suddenly realises that I need to praise him i think doesn't she mm. she says she yeah. you did a good job today and that's that's all he's wanted to hear that's what he's been saying up to this point is that i can't do anything right and no one ever mm. praises me and and here she is misato suddenly gets it it clicks um and then no sooner does that happen than, than she Shingi gets the punch in the face from toji gets the <laughs> and it's, it's all these conflicting things you just can't mm. get it right and it's Oh, it's so wonderfully crafted. Um, but yeah. It just drives him further and further into just his sort of mechanical, robotic approach to, to doing things. It's like, okay, I need to cut my wants and needs and just do exactly what people tell me to do. Because yeah. if I'm doing it for my own personal reward, it will just cause me more pain in the long run. If I'm disappointed or um, am satisfied and then just get knocked down again, it's it's not worth the damage to my pride and ego. So I'll just shut down completely. Mm, no matter what I do, I'm hurting someone. Mm. And uh, and I'm going to face the consequences of that. I think maybe, maybe that's the difference be- between this and the series. Just from memory, I might be wrong. But there seems to be a depressive state about Shinji in the original series where there isn't, oh God, yeah. where there isn't in this. He doesn't feel sorry for himself as much as he just... He he just goes numb to everything. And mm. Maybe that's a slight um, shift. Uh, again, as I say, I haven't seen the original series in 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 a while, so mm. um, I don't want to say that's a fact too much. But it strikes me as it, it does ring a bell. Shin- Shinji is a lot more pathetic. Is always the word that springs to mind. Essentially, he's he's got a bit more to him in this. You know, mm. he's willing to sort of have a bit of back chat and. Mm. Maybe not stand up for himself, but be a bit 
a bit more assertive in Shinji terms. Yeah, he he's willing to call people out when they're being hypocrites, I mm. think. Um, which is good. And so, yeah, this is um, our introduction to Toji and Kensuke, really. And um, Toji uh, comes across as uh, the school bully, essentially. But at the same time, he seems to be a bit of a bully with morals because he's saying uh, th- th- this might be a difference between the series and the films as well. Um, because in this, he, he I, again, sorry, I, I can't remember from the series, but he says, I don't want to do this, but I've got to do this for my, for my family's honor. Almost. Yeah. For my sister. I gotta, I gotta hit you, man. Yeah. And, um, and then Ken Stia comes in and, and essentially doubly apologizes. And it's like, you know, that's just how it is kind of thing. And then mm. Shinji back chats him and then Toji just flies off the hook. But even, uh, even then you can kind of see how pathetic this kid is and it's kind of, he punches him, but he's like he's he's so conflicted in himself because yeah he's just, just like, like there, there's nothing in this <laughs> yeah yeah you've 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 got no honor to anything you do I, I'm I'm confused by you I, I can't get it the, what I did was for my family's honor and pride but you you just what are you I can't even get my head around it and then later on of course um Toji and Kensuke are in the situation where they see the pressures that Shinji's under and they kind of realize and and uh, and everything changes but uh yeah this is another great scene for just messing Shinji up and excuse me him not understanding um how we can do things right um so yeah uh and then that follows through in the next scene where again point and shoot mhm Easiest way to deal with it. Just shut off completely. And that's what he does. And um, did it ever strike you as well just how uh, pointless and irrelevant this exercise is? It's purely yeah. to um, to get him to conform. Because yeah, essentially. We've already seen from the actual angel battle that using a gun and firing at it isn't going to do the slightest bit of difference. You need to be, yeah. uh, you know... You need to have tactics with these angels. They have AT fields. It's the human weapons aren't mm. of, of any um, damage to them. That shot of the the drone—it's just horrifying. It's horrific. There's basically just a brain and lungs being suspended uh, in animation, so that it, so that they can test a kid's reflex and wear him down. But yeah, like you say, it is all about conformity because while they're um, God, look at that. Uh, while they're running these simulations, they're talking about okay, what's his uh, his synchronicity rate and you know what blood pressure and all that, and it's got absolutely nothing to do with with Shinji pointing and clicking and pulling the trigger, mm. which again he takes to heart. And the moment he tries to put into action, like they told him to, like they drilled into him. They immediately cut. I think Masada calls him an idiot. You know, get out of there. It's not working. You fucked it up. Um, and uh, and then yeah, the the fight turns on its head, and they're right back to square one again. Yeah. Uh, I just love the banality of this scene as well. Let's go with a coffee mm, cup. With just no a lies. coffee, just standing there. Just standing. <laughs> it's it's great. Um, we don't really explore the uh, the nerve staff as we do in the series. Mm. They become quite prominent. Uh, towards the end, maybe they do the second film. I can't remember. Do you remember the names? You've got long, oh, uh, you've got long haired guy. You've got short haired girl, <laughs> and then guy with glasses. And then guy with glasses. I, I remember their archetypes, but I can't remember their names. We we used to remember her name in particular because mm. uh, we really liked the dynamic that she had with uh, with Ritsuko. A yeah. lot like the class rep. I can't remember class rep's name. <gasps> oh, of course, because she's a lesbian, isn't she? And uh, yeah, ev- ev- end of Evangelion when they're or all at least seen. heavily implied because it's very difficult with. The, the way that Japanese culture works, you know, they're sort of like... But she idolises Ritsuko. Uh, idolises her as a sensei, and it, it can come off as a bit like... Um, God damn it, I'm forgetting all the names, but, um, you know, Azamanga Dayo, the, the character who could very well be gay or just absolutely enthralled with the upperclassmen. It's very hard to tell. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, for the longest time, we just assumed that, that it was a lesbian uh, sort of romantic interest that she had in Ritzko. And it's like, that. that's interesting. That adds to sort of her character and what she's working towards and everything else. It didn't feel sort of like forced or shoehorned. And it, it can be read that it's just a, a, an utter deep loving respect for her as a... Um, as a sort of superior in in the ways of science and everything for what she's created. Mm. And yeah, it is a shame we don't get to spend more time with them again for, you know, the 
fleeting moments we spend with them. Um, the one that we spend the least amount of time with is long haired guy. Yeah, uh, he's because... only like in one shot, two shots. Yeah. yeah, it's very strange. Do you remember in the day Tokyo 3 stood still? A uh, guy with glasses is out doing his laundry and he hijacks uh, like a speaking van so that he can drive around the neighbourhood <laughs> saying, there's an angel coming! <laughs> and he saves the day, effectively. <laughs> uh, just a brief point. I don't think that Azamanga Dayo has ever been mentioned in an Evangelion video as much as it has in this one. So I think... <laughs> They're entwined, They're entwined. In, in the way we did it. They are quintessentially entwined. <laughs> I, thought, I, I just felt <laughs> as though I had to point that out. Um, I love this scene of uh, Misato mm. and Risco on the uh, kind of stairlift thing being brought down. The incredibly get... risky looking stairlift. It does, doesn't it? It's, it's just a pole. <laughs> They're just sitting on a coat, uh, what do you call it, a coat hanger. <laughs> <laughs> but I like it. And it's another one of those scenes where they're having dialogue about things and uh, you, you, you feel part of their... Um, just my meld almost i think uh between them as misato's just trying to figure shit out she's as confused as everyone else in this and she doesn't know how to play certain things and and to her ritsuko has got everything figured out and mm. unfortunately as we were saying that's not explored in this how she doesn't um but yeah the, there's always the, the the constant um juxtaposition between the two of them even even with how they're uh sitting there yeah you know Risku, very uh, professional, smoking a cigarette, cool and calm, and Misato is essentially a child. The way she's, uh, <laughs> the way she's uh, sat, d- displaying herself, loves yeah, like swinging that. her legs. Ah, oh, yeah, it's it's wonderful stuff. It is. Um, again, I wish I had subs so we could know exactly what they're talking about because I just know that we're missing something great. We go. Yeah, we, we should. If we'd done this a couple of years ago, we could have done it from Roach, really, couldn't we? Without uh, without any need of subtitles. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we don't get as many scenes with Shinji in school for obvious reason. They are mm. cut, and it's uh, it's a bit of a shame. I think we only get one or two flashes in and out, uh, just with. Yeah, I think we get this one scene of Shinji entering the classroom, and then the shot later on because Shinji is not in the classroom. Yeah. And that's it. <laughs> yeah, and this one is really only to show that Ray is in the same class as Shinji, and Shinji's mm. still confused by her. And uh, again, these are just the just just what we were saying about Ray not really being as developed as she is, and and that must be a a conscious decision mm. um, to just have her even further on the periphery and and uh, and not. I learn. guess. I guess it makes sense. You know, Shinji's got enough going on in his life, the world and everything in it, to, to have Ray sort of appear any earlier. Yeah. You know, it's just like, okay, my life is sort of settling into a, a new state. I've got my house. I've got my um, I've got my work life now and my work routine and my school life. And this is where Ray sort of comes back into it, in the, uh, the peripherals at least. Yeah, so Shinji's on the roof and uh, Ray comes to get him and... Uh... And essentially says, we need to go, I think, doesn't she? Um, Near enough, yeah. yeah. There's an angel coming. There's an angel coming. <laughs> Yay. Let's, uh, let's take this show on the road. And Shinji's like... <laughs> That's what she says. <laughs> she take this show on the road. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, let's rock and roll. And, <laughs> Up um... and at them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, there's a new angel on its way. This is the fifth angel, um, I think. Is I... Can you... Re- Remember the it names? was originally the fourth angel, but now it's the fifth angel, I think, or the sixth, and it's uh, Shamshel, which I forget the Hebrew interpretation of it, but uh, yes, it's the uh, the very phallic one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it's the one with all the little um, tentacly oh. things. Uh, Which I gotta say, the the original design in the show, uh, it was fine. You know, it it was basically just a tube with a couple of ribs on it, and then the kind of like squid head. Um, they have really worked hard to to give this one a bit more oomph. Mm. You know, with its like clacking rib cage and you know spiked mandibles and everything. Yeah, I I really like the the tweaks they've given to this. I was this gonna one. say it's right down your street as far yeah. as uh, monster designs concerned. Uh, so we get a view of the. Uh, Tokyo 3 skyline going underground now just to sort of accentuate oh there's a big nerve sign on that building that's interesting never noticed that before ah. um, huh. 
Hmm. Again, just I'd, I'm sure it's out there somewhere. The law around these skyscrapers and things. Um, might need to research that for the next show. Yeah, it's the one thing we've never actually looked into. It's like the, the geo front. <laughs> we've always been so intrigued by the characters, the angels, the uh, the deeper lore in mythology that we've never thought to look into the actual architecture of everything. Yeah, and how you know all this grass and trees and things can survive under. <laughs> under it's part of the geo front, isn't it? They're sort of within. No, they're not in the egg of Lilith, are they? Oh, no, the black how... egg is beneath. But I think it's sort of like a wellspring of life that's okay. being generated. Oh, I, ne I never knew that. Oh, cause mm. it, it, it did always make me be like, what, don't they need sunlight? Anyway, yeah, it's sort of like a hollow earth theory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, so all the battle enforcements are being brought to the surface now um, as this new angel is on its way and uh and the elementary school kids are the only ones that ever seem to be evacuated for some reason you notice that <laughs> <laughs> you've got to protect the future <laughs> it's like where are these kids parents well <laughs> <laughs> I, I think they're at school at the time aren't they so that makes sense yeah, but yeah, yeah, um yeah. i think we do see uh, again it's a series i'm pretty sure in the series we see a lot more densely packed shelters particularly in the day tokyo three stood still yeah yeah you're correct um Yes, yeah, so uh, the, the angel's a really freaky looking thing. It's got all manner of uh, creepy crawly insecty mixed with a squid kind of vibe about it. It's gross. It's a Cronenberg wet dream. It it's, is. It's uh, an insectoid phallus. <laughs> Mm -hmm. What more could you want in your creatures? We haven't really talked much about the angels themselves, which have some really wonderful, weird, unique, some of them just downright bizarre designs. Uh, have we even spoken about what the angels' purpose are? Uh, by the way, before I forget, Insectoid Phallus is a great band name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the, the angels... <laughs> we haven't spoken about the angels and their purpose, no, really, no, have we? Then? That's 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 all all yours. That's your area of expertise. Hmm. So, um, oh, what's the easiest way to sort of sum this one up? So, in the beginning, there was Adam, the the sort of the first being, essentially. Adam is, for want of a better word, God. Uh, God crash lands on Earth. Um, Lilith follows shortly thereafter. Not too sure if they're sort of like spawned from him or other beings in the galaxy uh but effectively the angels are sort of aliens um that humanity could, uh, essentially uh, what could have been the sort of like the the species that propagated the earth uh humanity got sort of lucky and drew the card um and and became like the the 17th angel that became the most numerous and populous and now we've got sort of almost like a, a one-off of each of these other species we don't know where they really came from but um effectively if angels three through 16 or 14 whatever the new tally is merge with lilith it will reset the clock and the new age of of their time will will happen so that's why they're also desperately fighting to get to Lilith because it's essentially extinction there each, each of these different 17 angels or the, the 15 angels are fighting for their right not to go extinct mm. um, and it's just that humanity's got slightly more skin in the game in this regard because we have been existing all this time mm. the great mystery is sort of why they're being awakened um, although in Magma Diver we do find out that there are embryos here there and everywhere they're like the, the proto forms um so I guess there is just like one embryo of each and they awake and they instinctively seek out Lilith to sort of get, complete their purpose. Um, but yeah, that's that's essentially what they are. I imagine across Earth and, and the moon and, and space, these other life forms are sort of out there and want what we have. And it means the eradication of everything else to uh, to achieve it. This this information isn't freely given as well in the series. It's worth No, you've got to well. work for you, it. It's, yeah, exactly. It's... it's the original Bloodborne in that sense of you can mm. you can you can play through it you can play through Bloodborne you can watch through Evangelion and get entertained by the action set pieces and the what's on screen but there's so much hidden underneath the uh, mm. underneath the surface as it as it were to really dig into the law that they want to um, uh, uh, you know exist on mm. this uh, 
on this story. Um, but I'm yeah, not helped by the fact that the in- the initial DVD releases had the most of the deleted scenes and extended episodes were the law related information dumps, and they all got cut when these first came out on VHS and DVD. Mm. Yeah, very frustrating. Uh, in fact, we didn't go into that story, did we? We, we should. I think it's in another podcast. Of, yeah, uh, yeah the, the, I own about four copies of Evangelion, three of the Platinums, and I treasure them. Just but, like, uh, especially now they're deleted. But. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Constantly buying random copies on eBay in the hope that they were the fabled extended editions, and mm-hmm. so many disappointments. But it makes for a great story these days. Got there in the end. Um, so yeah, in terms of the angels, I mean. Uh, just a sort of side story. Any particular favourites? I'll be honest with you. The Angels were never really my focus on this mm. show. And um, it should come as no surprise, really, for anyone that's paid attention to our podcast and things in the past, that I'm kind of... how What's the best way to put it? I'm I'm quite straightforward, I think, when it comes to things like this. All my um, interests are with character. Character always over plot. Plot never really phases me too much in the sense that, uh, you know, Peter Parker has always been more interesting to me than Spider-Man has mm. been. You know, the uh, villains that Spider-Man comes up against is secondary in my perspective to uh his relationship with MJ let's say or whatever just or and they or just how that kind of thing works and then and then and, <laughs> and then and then mixed with that is um uh my uh, just kind of um what's the best way to put it i've always related entirely i suppose with like the, the key protagonists so in star in the OG Star Wars when people gravitate towards Han Solo i've always been a a, a Luke kind of guy just because i'm I'm that way inclined. I'm quite boring in that sense. So, um, with regards to Evangelion, th- those things kind of come together, and it's always uh, been the plight of Shinji, and you know how people exist within Shinji's world that has always fascinated me most about about the, the story. So the angels were always more uh, window dressing, I suppose, mm. and it, it, they they never entertain me to the extent that I know you were definitely, you know, fascinated by, by each of them. So I, I couldn't honestly say, I don't know if I'd say, um, say kill, uh, just because I feel that fight is so iconic. Yeah. Um, in again, the entire first episode of Evangelion is iconic. I think every single second is, um, just stands out. And so I don't know if just, just for that simple, bland, basic reason, um, yeah, I to be honest, I would struggle to um to to give you the other angels. I think the one that always sticks with me is um uh the one that causes Aska to mentally break down. I think from a Ariel. Yeah. From, I knew from, that would be the one. From from a, a plot purely because it's a, from a plot standpoint. It does something mm. to one of the main characters that that instigates a reaction it's not just something to fight or yeah. you know a, a plot contrivance to kind of um find a way around it it, it, it affects one of the characters uh, well, to that extent what characters. about uh luriel from episode uh, i want to say 14 yeah the splitting of the breast the the one that was uh, a combination of shadow and okay yeah sure corporeal form yeah 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 sure um yeah yeah that one <laughs> yeah, sure, that one. Yeah, whatever, sure, whatever that Matt. One. Let's move on. <laughs> but no, but all I'm trying to say is, um, yeah. the uh, the the sorry, what which, what was the name of the one I mentioned first? Uh, Ariel. Yeah, Ariel. Listen to me. Ariel. <laughs> <laughs> In the human world, <laughs> it's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> She's a redhead as well, so it fits. <laughs> um, <laughs> I wonder if, you got, if that's what's playing in her head. <laughs> <laughs> okay, get back on track. We've tried, we've tried bludgeoning them with brute strength. We've tried psychological mind games. <laughs> Have we tried musical numbers? <laughs> Have we tried Little Mermaid numbers? Yeah. Unfortunately, they tried it on Asuka. He wasn't having any of that shit. <laughs> this uh, this does look like it could have been a creature from under the sea because it is uh, horrifying. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> just trying to <laughs> crowbar it into um, the new plays the flute, the yeah. bass plays <laughs> the brass, <laughs> the, <laughs> the champ shell plays your nerves. <laughs> Oh, Disney, uh, Little Mermaid, Evangelion crossover. We all, we've all needed. <laughs> it's happening. Twenty twenty three. We'll make it reality. <laughs> Why not? By that point, Disney will have bought up Gainax, and uh, and the whole thing begins anew. Studio car. Yeah. Um. So no, I can't. I can't give you any definitive um, answer on that because that's just not where my focus lied. But uh, tell no, us, tell us, tell us about yours because I know, as I say, you you are the uh, the monster man, the angel guy, the. Uh, that that is your area of expertise. So, which ones have stood out for you all these years later? Well, I like the fact that as the series goes on, they try something a little bit different each time. Like um, the the three we see in this movie are like the the heavy hitters, yeah. um, particularly um, Ramiel later on. Just a, a tank, uh, just a tanks it through the uh, through the mission, um, and then we get different ones like the the one that splits in half when you attack it, and then it attacks in perfect. Uh, sequence some really weird and wonderful ones like the giant fish monster which is just fun because underwater monsters are always fun and you got one in a volcano that's like an ancient trilobite that they can only fight with like this big deep pressure suit that's heat resistant but it means that they're almost completely incapable of moving because it's uh, just this big old bubble they're trapped in that's a good one but um, yeah no sorry i was gonna say i don't know why but i don't like magma diver and i don't know why that is i don't know if that's because it's on the precipice of when the show shifts and mm. it's like um it's still very much a mecha anime until yeah. just after that that's like i think one of the final episodes before the shift happens and mm. and it starts becoming become more interesting and so magma dive has always stood out a bit as just being one episode too far sorry karen yeah, no, I'll agree with you there because we don't really learn all that much from Magnum, uh, Magma Diver from a uh, a world building or a character perspective, given mm. that it's essentially, um, in some regards, a Masato and uh, Asuka uh, bottle episode. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I can't think of anything that we truly learn from that uh, apart from, you know, the, the dormant state of of the uh, the embryos and the angels, which you know it's a bit of lore, but doesn't really do much. Um, but uh, yeah, I like the fact that as the series goes on, the angels sort of get more intelligent and more insidious. You've got the, like you said, the one that does the psychological warfare on Asuka and it's, it just essentially it mind rapes her and it, mm. it just leaves her catatonic until, well, all the way through basically end of Evangelion. It really does a number on her. And again, it's interesting to see the ones that have an impact on the characters. Um, and then the the one after it, I can never remember its damn name, but it's basically a DNA strand by that they're getting more and more abstract as you go along and then yeah. this one's just basically a halo turned DNA strand that oh, merges with Ray yeah and uh, so we get a lot more that's Ray 3 isn't it which is one of the best episodes yeah because yeah, yeah. Uh, it really dives into her psychology that and is a this, great one yeah this sort of thing and everything that touches it then sort of becomes a part of it and it just sort of heightens the stakes mm. um, so yeah that's a damn good one and then Karu Karu's Karu. an interesting character hmm <laughs> Who uh, even now we're still trying to get our heads completely around Karu, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it, there's a nice blend of freaky monsters and ones that make you think, and ones that make our characters think, and then just some good old, good old spidery things. Spidery things. Uh, <laughs> let's get back to this yeah, one let's because um, it's really starting to kick off now. The angel is uh, beating up Unit One and. Um, this kind of falls back to what we were saying earlier where Shinji's just been told to point and shoot a gun. I think if you really study this, and um, again, this is, 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 is one of the things that I'm only um, looking at now, all these years later, and, and kind of wondering if um, this was Anno's point. They're constantly feeding Shinji guns and things, despite the fact that we know from the first angel that was completely pointless. In a lot of ways, they seem clueless and they don't learn their lesson. And they're barreling along, f uh, you know, f full speed in one direction and being completely um, unwilling. Um, to flinch uh, on what their tactics to, are. Yeah, it's like these are our tactics. We're just going to go with them. And again, there's no. We already know that they. Uh, Shinji's just a pawn at this point. They have no interest in his in his personal well-being and there seems to be a real arrogance and a real 
ignorance mm. about nerve and that's only just dawned on me as we've been as we've been going through it and um we especially see it in 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 this just because of how horrifying this monster is at uh, this angel is excuse me it's like they despite the fact that they've already had this encounter with the first angel they're still underestimating them and have mm. seem to have zero uh plan b despite the fact that they've built this fantastic you know fortress infrastructure um they're completely clueless as to what lies ahead of them and are too arrogant to even consider that they may be underprepared in different ways and um this this angel has the whips the kind of electrified whips and he's just tearing apart the city again it, mm. we won't go into it again <laughs> but okay the city's been destroyed again it just and it's not even like in uh you know yeah this is literally buildings being sliced in half and flung across the city yeah and uh and, and unit one's like collapsing into the mall and stuff so christ knows how there's even a city left after this but whatever <laughs> Uh, and only 100 people left the other day. You'd have thought there'd be a little bit more than that. Um, <laughs> but it looks great anyway. I, I, I wonder in part if it, it's very hard to sort of get a read on these things, but if Rescue knows that all we've got to do is keep Unit 1 going long enough for Berserk Mode to kick in, then keep it supplied, keep the Angel sort of at arm's length enough for sort of Shinji to really piss it off, essentially. Mm. And uh, and then hope that Berserk Mode kicks in again. I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, that was her intention, being as close to Gendo, left outside the picture as she is. You know, she must have slightly more of an inkling than Misato and most of the staff in, in you know, sort of what the, the end game and the capabilities are. Mm. So, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, Risku is somewhat aware that we just have to do what we can to keep Shinji in the fight long enough for, for uh, Unit 1 to, you know, take charge of things but it's definitely futsuki and gendo that are you know planning that long game yeah um the whips slice um unit one the the, the energy cable of unit one and suddenly there's this countdown that we weren't even aware of oh it's gone um Hello, sorry. <laughs> it's it's introducing new perils which mm. um, which i like it's it's good because in the in the first fight the peril was oh shit shinji's been killed and then uh how does he survive it goes into beast mode and then this introduces a new element of well how do you power an evangelion you obviously do it with uh, a big cable and um and uh and then to slice that almost it, it it's like is is that something then that beast mode can't work with because if you pull the energy out of it and uh can it still exist in beast mode and so th they're just throwing up new uh uh, problems anyway um and yeah so th this is another moment from the series that's very powerful leading up to this and um i will always remember the first time i saw it because i'd never experienced anything like it and it's um i think every time i i mean i haven't shown this series to, to too many people because it's uh, i don't know enough people to show it to really aside from you i think i showed it my sister <laughs> which was probably a bit weird my sister was like 40 13 14 at the time and uh <laughs> i was like you gotta watch this series and <laughs> looking at now it's about like, children you watch. Yeah. you'll enjoy it <laughs> um but i'm always interested to see people's reaction to the shinji scream the first mm. one because it's built up so much we i remember you you made a big deal about the shinji scream <laughs> yeah oh did i beforehand or after, uh, well, or... it, 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 afterwards, it was like, afterwards. oh, that's the scene I was waiting for. That was the oh, scene. Oh, did I really? That's interesting. Um, yeah, because it took me by surprise. And um, the first time I saw it, because I'd never felt that kind of visceral emotion before. And especially considering it's animated. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can say there's something in live action films about that type of reaction. But when it's animated uh, and you know that there's a voice actor... And from a narrative standpoint, everything that Shinji's been through up until this this point, um, it's just the release of all that emotion. And so, mm. uh, so what happens is um, Shinji is in this uh, a bit of a bind. Let's say he's been <laughs> thoroughly, <laughs> the least. he's been thoroughly decimated by this angel, 
and uh, to make it worse, uh, Tojo and uh, Kensuke. I hope his name is Kensuke. I said Kensuke, and I, I think it's Kensuke. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm going from like 15 year old memory at this point. <laughs> um, he they have found themselves in the way of the uh, fight, and uh, Shinji essentially starts sacrificing himself to make sure that uh, that they don't come into harm's way, and mm. then. Uh, Misato makes the most baffling call watching it back to <laughs> it really is bizarre yeah they have zero empathy for Shinji <laughs> at all and then all of a sudden you got these two randos idiots <laughs> that that shouldn't be in that vicinity anyway and uh, and she said and she ejects Shinji's um a uh, little pod thing and tells them mm. to jump in despite the fact that they're, they're already on a timer they've got three and a half minutes left um, they've got to scrabble up the evangelion to get in there in the first place uh, they, they've in the in this they don't do it in the film but they make a point in the series of how um uh sensitively balanced the acl is um mm. and then all of a sudden <laughs> they dump these two uh idiot <laughs> teenagers in there as fully if, clothed. Fully clothed. This Shinji's not already under enough pressure. So, uh, narratively, that doesn't make too much sense, but it well, it, it heightens the tension, and it's uh, it's it's uh, yeah, it's it's sure. necessary for what they want to happen. But, Sorry, M- Masato's plan is like get the kids inside the the plug and then run away, and it's like that's that's a really bad plan given that yeah. you know Unit One is your ace in the hole. It's got. What, three minutes of power left at this moment? You want it to turn into a runner uh, so that it has essentially just un, un, uh, what's the word? Uh, unfettered access to mm. wreak havoc on, on nerve while you're depowered. Just like, t- no, this is terrible advice. Yeah. Good on Shinji for just, you know, having his, his little breakdown and, uh, and doing the right thing. But uh, yeah, what a boneheaded plan by Masato's standards. Unless uh, the idea is to just get a new charge cable or something maybe i mean they have everything else just lying around yeah, here they, possibly. They, yeah. they shot up the little things and with a with a ginormous gun in it and he just grabs it and it's kind of so i mean this this city's yeah. kitted out it doesn't make any sense considering people live there but it's kitted out um and so maybe maybe that was her plan um uh but shinji uh as, as we were talking about earlier this is the part where shinji's thinks to himself um all oh, People have been chastising me for running away time and time again. I'm not going to run away now. And it's like, mm. he's he's trying to make a point that I'm learning my lesson. Um, and I'm going to do the right thing here. And um, and again, Misato's uh, scream, screaming at him, telling him that he's doing the wrong thing. And it's, it's one of the only moments where Shinji um, makes a decision of himself. And, yeah, um, yeah, it's... Uh... Good on Shinji for that. Yeah, and maybe so, the, the worst possible time to do it, but whatever. Um, yeah, I'm hesitant to go into it anymore because we've spoken about it quite a few times mm. already. But it is, it's, it, um, from a set piece perspective, it looks fantastic with the uh, unit one flying down the hill, and mm. you know that the, the the timer is is going on. He's disobeyed Masato's orders, and. Um, it's one of the high points. Well, I mean, there are many high points of drama in the series. Uh, so let's not go with the series. We'll go with the movies. Um, mm. This is this is up there. This is one of the. To me, this is probably the um, ultimate peak of the movie, possibly more so than the finale. Um, yeah, this is Shinji's kill. Yeah, you know, he he did it by himself of his own volition. He he takes a knife and literally charges the thing and gets the the killing blow despite you know being almost mortally wounded by the thing the evangelion doesn't help him out the team doesn't help him out he hasn't got backup from ray yeah this is Shinji's crowning moment and it's also the one that is chewed out for him reprimanded by his um his new mother figure or older sister figure so again more conflict for him to to deal with to, to try and just get his head around and um yeah but like you say, he's he's mortally wounded. That's another part of this where he slides down and he's like, I'm going to sacrifice myself. And then there's this oof, you know, where you can see it. So the animation is so wonderful. How you, you can feel it, where the, uh, the, the whips tear through the uh, Unit 1's stomach. Mm. And it's on his face. It's, like, oof. it's so... You, you, can, you can feel it. You can feel the pain. And yet still, he, he pushes on um, to, to do this because he just... 
it's like the right thing to do. And as he keeps saying to himself, I mustn't run away, I mustn't run away, I mustn't run away. Um, he's, it's like, yeah, he's, he's learning. He's, he's trying to do the right thing. He's, he, he wants to, um, do right by people. And, and as we see in the, in the next scene, it's, uh, he still can't do right. Um, but the scream, just go back to the scream. So I don't want to gloss Mm. over just how powerful that scream (laughs) is. The Uh, 20 to 30 second long never ending scream. And there was a big fuss about the dub as well, doing it in the dub and and doing it justice in the dub. And it's, it's Spike Spencer, I think that does the English dub. And, um, I, I, I've read before that he felt that was a big pressure because he, a lot of pressure because he wanted to do it justice. Mm. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, every time I see it, I feel that scream in my bones and, um, cause it feels like such a release. You can, you feel all of his angst and all of his, um, just desperation and, uh, and, and the vocal before, in fact, I'm going to, cause it's really ignorant of me not to, uh, not to know the name of the Japanese voice. First, so it's Megumi Ogata. Agata Megumi, who I assume is a, a lady. I think it is a lady. I'm mm. pretty sure it is. Yeah, it is. Um, and yeah, it's just incredible. It's one of the uh, pinnacle moments of anime, as far as I'm concerned. My uh, development in anime. And then um, when Shinji's struggling to, to kill the thing as, it, as the time is counting down, it's just, it's just <laughs> amazing. Amazing. And it's a shame because it's one of the most under, what's the word I'm looking for? Maybe not underrepresented, but it's not often one of the go-to moments of Evangelion. Mm. You know, it's like the, the Ramiel fight, you know, the whole Angels of Doom and, and Operation Yashima and all that. And, you know, Asuka strikes and it, it it just feels like, well, it's the second angel, you know, it's sort of, we, we've had the, the first one, that was the big one, now we've got the, the big tank one coming, this is the, the one in the middle that sort of bridges the gap, but it, it is the one with the most heft to it, the most that's going on behind the scenes for such a sort of innocuous battle that's nowhere near as sort of, I'm not visually interesting, for, for want of a better term, as, as uh, some of the others in terms of uh, spectacle and scope, but in terms of emotion, as you've just yeah. detailed, um, there's there's so much going on, and it feels like it's the most glossed over of the early angel battles. Well, it is a turning point for Shinji, because, you know, he, he up until this point, he's settled himself into the idea of, I'm just going to numb myself to the world and do what people tell me, and that'll be fine. Um and then after this, after he gets reprimanded, he leaves, doesn't he? He goes and he lives out on the streets. He yeah, abandons. Yeah, he goes full refuge. Yeah, because he's like, I don't know what you want of me anymore. Um, I am just confused. And um, I um, don't want to be a part of, of what you're doing. I, I, you, And he just lives this kind of not a nomadic existence because it's not really a nomadic existence but but it's getting there you know he's he's just floating around he's just yeah he's got no desire to um to just be in one place i suppose yeah he just wants to be off the grid away from it all mm. just slumming it yeah um and of course this is a big moment for his relationship with uh toji and kensuke because they finally see um what this fellow 14 year old has got to put up with and uh, mm. and as he's broken down and you know blubbering to himself over all this pressure that he's under um they suddenly think shit well we're a bit of we dicks aren't we for <laughs> for smacking <laughs> him about when when he's uh doing what he's doing especially bart but especially lisa <laughs> Uh, so yes, Misato is saying, "Why didn't you uh, heed the um, the order that I gave you?" And Shin- uh, Shinji again in just how he is so confused, but at the same time wants to point out the hypocrisy um, that the and, and the double standards that he's constantly feeling. Just says, "We won. We we yeah. What more do you want from me? What more do you want?" 
Mm. And sure, uh, that's the whole point, isn't it? To defeat angels. I defeated an angel. I did my job. Get off my back. And she doesn't really have an answer for that. Um, because what does she say after that? Does she just um, tell him to leave or something? I can't remember. She goes to slap him, doesn't she? And she... Uh... Yeah, she she, 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 she grabs the show, him. I think she she, yeah. she grabs him. She grabs him because it's kind of like who who the hell do you think you are situation. Mm. And um, again, he's he's got in this 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 is the second time, third time now. Someone's grabbed him by the scruff of the neck and yeah, and he's and just he's looking away, he's just looking away. He's it's kind like of perfect. To, go on then, hit me. What do I care? Perfect to this pathetic, you know, kind of not a cowering dog, but just I know my, you know, what difference does it make you? It's, 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 uh, not yeah, I, I already know my place in the world. Beating me down won't prove it anymore. Yeah. I know I'm. I know that I'm beneath you. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and and it's that smile. It's that smile on on Shinji's face, as I'd say. I've I've got under your skin. Yeah, <laughs> you I know, win. I win, kind <laughs> of thing. E- even though he doesn't care, there's still a, a part of him that just he understands the injustice. I think mm. that 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 he's experiencing, and that's what it is. Um, even though he doesn't care anymore, he knows, as I say, in the double standards that everyone else is. He's the only one that's aware of the hypocrisy that is just literally everywhere around Nerve. All these people talking about saving humanity, and as I say, they've lost all of their humanity. There's not one person in there that um, that that gives much consideration to human life, especially considering the total destruction of Tokyo Three that goes. <laughs> and that's one of the things I was saying about how arrogant they are. I think is that they're giving Shinji these guns with these giant uh, ammo shells, and one of the scenes we see is the ammo shells mm-hmm. flying everywhere, and they're just crushing cars, smashing everything, smashing in the everything, path. everything yeah. up, and it's this 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 arrogance, wanton destruction. Yeah, it's just like, well, it gets the job done, does it not? They just no interest in yeah. collateral damage at all. Um, this is this is their job, and and the human element doesn't come into it. And in yeah, fact, so yeah. Th- there's the irony in that um but anyway so shinji leaves she's like uh she says whatever she says i can't remember um just a, a final kind of get out of here or something um and then shinji leaves and she slaps herself and um yeah it's a nice little moment it is it is it, it, and it, it's that sign as well that misato is aware of the hypocrisy i think and yeah and, and her and her um place within that she's she's fully culpable with with regards to um what she's been telling shinji to do and 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 then having double standards and um confusing him and and all that kind of thing well the other thing is uh you know the slap can have multiple meanings is it a slap for herself for losing control is it a slap for herself for the fact that she was baited by a child and and you know played into his hands is it that she just needs that slap back into reality it's like okay right that moment's over on with the next job you know there's lots of ways that it can be interpreted or just yeah. I, I i failed him as a mother figure and or i failed this entire operation because i can't even keep control you know there's so many different ways that you can pick it apart and interpret what exactly is going on mm. but um yeah either way it drives shinji away yeah and it's it's great great little scene um just uh, we've we've gone past it now. I kind of mentioned it briefly earlier, just about these shots that we don't get in the West. I, I just love lingering on the uh, the uh, uh, blah, 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 the drink um, uh, con that's yeah, kind of just, just the the spilled cup just on the floor. I just love stuff like that, and <laughs> and these scenes as well. These are ones again. I spoke about my own personal um, mental state the first time I watched it and the uh, the series. And um, uh, it is 25. I thought it was 25. Oh, it it's is 25. Okay. It's, I knew it was a, a five and a six that switched between. Yeah, it's one hour uh, 16. It's 16. Yeah, the one yeah. hour 16. That's what threw me off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, must have amazing batteries for that thing. Anyway, uh, so my mental state the first time that I saw it was, was very much in, in line with Shinji and just this de- despondency and, and depression, as often kids are at, at that age. And and these were the scenes that always stuck with me from these early episodes was as Shinji's just by himself um, going around the city. And I think they're really well um, uh, realised in, uh, in, in this as well. I think there's so much... Um, 
the loneliness, I suppose, in the, just the most rudimentary way of saying it. He... You can you can feel it. You can feel his um, how abandoned he feels, and uh, he just doesn't want to be be a part of it anymore. He just wants to to drift, and um, and they do a, a great job of of just showing him uh, just just drifting throughout Tokyo 3. Uh, all with a bit of humor as well. The guy that falls asleep um, <laughs> next to him is, is great. Um, yeah. Uh, I'll skip through a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, it gave me an appreciation for rain as well. Um, mm, the little puddles of water. It's such a simple touch that like the guy's umbrella where the most water's pooled. Yeah. I mm. have always loved um, how anime uh conveys rain it just feels really even, even when it's done to 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 make the environment feel cold as as evangelion often does evangelion has a lot of rain scenes early uh in the in the series to to match shinji's mood there's just something at the same time that i don't know it just feels really homely to me it's uh it's always been quite attractive mm. anyway uh yeah he wanders Around the, how the hell do you have districts like this when it's been constantly under attack? That's just, <laughs> that's they're just out in the sticks. <laughs> they're, they're way out in, in, in the next city. You know, there's Tokyo 3, and this is probably, I don't know, uh, Kyoto 1 or Kyoto 2. Okay. <laughs> it can't all be Tokyo, surely. He, he, Kyoto. We get a nice shot of him in the mountains, and Kyoto is sure, still pretty Tokyo. close to Tokyo, but yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, but. Yeah, I, I think it's they do a good job of as well when he's sleeping out rough. Um, just yeah, it feels really cold, and they do a great job. This is also another iconic scene from the series. Shinji looking down on, uh, well, it is Tokyo Three, I think, um, yeah. and uh, and uh, the way that they show, oh, come on. Come on, scene. <laughs> you might have to skip forward a bit. I know, but I don't want to. No, this it. is it's pathos, Dan. <laughs> Just you wait till the elevator scene in the second film. Yeah, <laughs> it'll take days. <laughs> nope, skip past <laughs> it. Anyway, it's a really good. Uh, it it again. It just does such an amazing uh, job with um, creating stillness and times for reflection. And um, you can you can almost hear Shinji's thoughts. I think mm. in in these moments they're really effective. And um, yep, he eventually gets to the point where he goes to walk out of the city. That's it. He's done. And then he finds that the bridge has been taken out. And uh, he's just like, I know you're following me. Fine, let's just mm. I'll, I'll go back. Whatever, whatever you want to do. Yeah. I've had my I, I've proven my point, or the point has been proven to me that that. Uh... <laughs> that I can't get out. Up. Yeah. Uh and he has. He's he's been he's being followed all this time. Uh we're still only halfway through this movie. Jeez. Yeah, I think we're gonna have to put a pin in it for a day because i I can feel myself flagging and <laughs> it's all right. No, we'll we'll fly through the um we'll fly through the final set piece. We'll do this ten minutes and then you know um the final battle is a piece of cake. So just yeah. give, give me give me another half an hour. Okay, and, I uh, I can fly through half an hour. Yeah. Um We've we've done the main bit. So anyway, they bring they bring um, Shinji back, and again, this is another scene where he's kind of he's kind of making his point because Masato comes into the room and he says, "It's fine, I'll I'll, I'll pilot, I'll, I'll do what you want. I've I've had my." Uh, she says, "Did you enjoy getting out or something like that?" And he's mm. just like, "I'll do what you want me to do, whatever." And then she suddenly decides to change tact, and um, and she says, um, uh. Is this what she she essentially goads him again, doesn't she? Which is she goes back to the tactic of the uh, of the first time they met. It's like if you, if you don't want to do this and don't do it or something, take responsibility yeah. for yourself. And he's shocked to hear it, which has always surprised me because I'm just like, well, um, well, what do you expect? Humanity's <laughs> on the brink, of the precipice of disaster. <laughs> it's like, You've already, you know, used the carrot and stick often at the same time to get me to do stuff, and now you're telling me, oh no, you have complete freedom. You yeah. know what the stakes are now, but you totally have a choice. Yeah, so again, they're just uh, flip-flopping from one tactic to the other. And he's like, I, I don't know if it's just a, a bit of poor writing that, that this kind of seems to hit home a little bit more. But No, I, I think it's good writing, to be honest. I think it's it's so difficult because Shinji is so detached. I mean, mm. it's it's easy with the original Shinji because this one's got a bit more oomph about him. But um, Shinji is just so 
blank and vacant and borderline unreadable in what will or won't motivate him. I think they're at an equal loss as to what will work, and we're on a time scale here. Mm-hmm. And it's not like we can sort of like sit and wait for him to react to one before we try the other because we don't know how he's going to react because he's always essentially on like default in a deep funk mode. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just like throw everything at the window and see what sticks because yeah. <laughs> something's going to get a reaction out of him, surely. Yeah, um, but, you know, Misato's just like, uh, do what you're going to do, take responsibility yourself, stop being pathetic. Um, ba, 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 skipping through yeah, things. It's not until later that they, they do it again, don't they? Uh, later on in the hospital, and it's like, all right, fine, I'll show you Lilith. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And and that's <laughs> oh, that's another Team Four star thing, isn't it? Where <laughs> he meets her on the bridge, and she's like, "Hi, Shinji," and it's like, "You want me to pilot the robot again, don't you?" And she's like, "Well." No, not really. Just wanted to chat. It's like really. It's like, of course, I want you to part of the robot. Fuck you, Masato. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I need to take that out again. It's been far too long. <laughs> it is good. Um, and so Toshi tells Shinji to fight him, uh, to to punch him because he deserves it. Because, uh, because yes, that could have gone so bad the other way. You know, it's like, uh, you know, I I punched you, so you should punch me. And Shinji doesn't go well. You know, I I let you. You know, crawl inside my mother. <laughs> saying, <clears throat> and Toji's like, "Damn, I'm bound by my honor." <laughs> um, another reason why it's a shame that we don't get more schools uh, insight into the school is because this um, this bit with the swimming pool, and uh, it's to show that you know Ray obviously is isolated from the rest of her classmates. Uh, mm. That that would I think that's something that would have been good to see as well. Um, how, uh, you know, Ray exists within the classroom. Uh, we don't get that from Shinji either, just his, his place within the group of boys. But it's interesting mm. because in this point particularly, I don't know if you picked up on it, but the girls are shouting for Shinji, which does yeah. which does make you think that he's got some kind of celebrity status where they, mm. you know, they recognize him and maybe they think he's cute and and you know they they want to interact with him so yeah it's... well this time around there's a personal state because you know toji and um uh Ketsuke and... would have you know come back it's like oh my god we were there we were there with the precipice and shinji saved us so yeah like you say he's, yeah, he's a local hero it, it would have he's been... not just the ever pilot he's the hero that saved our classmen it would have been nice to have a scene again there are just this it does so many good things with just um, short scenes that, that build the wider world. Mm. I think we, we've we've picked up on a few that that would have been good as well, just to uh, just to put in there. And uh, Shinji shows his uh, fascination with uh, Ray just because she's so broken. Mm. Uh, and there's something about her that that's yeah. just ultimately appealing to him. Uh, so we get the flashback um, with Gendo, where Unit hey. Zero goes berserk, and you did a good job of setting that up already. That there's this kind of um, uh, unit zero goes into a uh, what what phrase did you use? It was really good. Existential crisis. Yes. Uh, yeah, sums it up as as good as anything. Where it's like, holy shit! I know what I am. I know what you did to me, Gendo. Uh, I gotta die. I gotta kill myself right now. And he doesn't even grant it that. He just locks it up in LCL fluid, drains its mind. I'm guessing some kind of amnesia, and then just reboot it and start again. Mm. And the important thing is Ray, who's so far been the most successful Ray. Yeah, yeah. Just but, uh, yeah, it's a horrifying scene, and the the sound effects because unlike um, Unit One, this thing doesn't have a mouth, but it's still screaming. Mm. It's wah. <laughs> yeah, and again, it's, it's it's a shame because it's all these deep lore things that uh, that, mm. that most people aren't even going to recognize. That it's just buried into uh, what we only learn after picking things up over the entirety of the of the series and stuff. Mm. Um, yeah, so this is a big moment as well, especially for Ray, where Gendo actually shows his his human side, um, where the Ray's um, a, a, a plug tube gets shot out, and he actually shows human emotions, and and he runs down um, once once Unit Zero's stopped trying to kill itself and it shuts down, he uh, he goes down to the to the plug tube and 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 tries to pull her out and and shows her, um, you know kindness and warmth and uh that mm-hmm. he's worried about her and and um she's only a shell of a person she's a she's like a 
a body without a soul, essentially. Yeah, so, that, that is literally what she is, essentially. <laughs> and so she, mm. she, she, she can't uh, conceptualise emotions and feelings. And that's one of the things where, when we get into the second film, becomes really interesting about this mm. rebuild, is how she um, becomes human. Human, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, but... And it's it's a bit jarring um, in some ways after, well, for, for me, it had been, what, I don't know, it had been two years, well, a year and a half of knowing only Ray, and then suddenly seeing her trying to be a part of the group, and it, it felt weird and jarring and sort of a portrayal of the character, but it's it's really interesting once you sort of absorb it and go oh so this is what they're going for now yeah especially to... especially if it's a sequel and so you need mm. things to change i think and um I, I mean we'll get into ray in the second film in the second film i suppose but uh, yeah but for now this is a first experience of of, uh, of sympathy and uh it comes from gendo and and she starts to um become uh, protective of Gendo, which we which we see shortly, she uh, kind of um, uh, what's the phrase for when you worship a, a like an object? idolizing? Yeah, uh, there's idolizing, but I think there's a proper word for like a, 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 a an object rather than a. Oh, I've got fetishizing in my head. Um, <laughs> anyway, of course, it doesn't matter. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go with idolizing. And she uh, idolizes his his glasses that are a, a representation of his sacrifice that he made to, to get her out of this LCL um, uh, and burns his hands and things. <laughs> if she'd collected his, uh, his, uh, his dead skin samples <laughs> and molded <laughs> itself to the, to the hot uh, metal. Well, I've, I've, I've sort of wondered that, you know, at the end of the film, obviously Shinji does the same move and, and burns his hands getting out. Is it really Gendo or Shinji she likes, or does she just have a thing for burn victims? <laughs> I guess we'll never truly know. No, I, no. I like this scene where she shows... Well, it's the only time she shows any animation in the, the film whatsoever. She sees Gondo coming and she's, just, she's happy. She bounces down and she trots on over to him and it's, uh, it's a cute little scene. And uh, then you think about, oh, actually, the, the context of mm. Gendo, this monster, and, and Ray, this shell of a human being and this sort of weird dynamic relationship they have at the sake of everyone else, including his own son. Um that he should show this kind of emotion and elicit this kind of reaction from her when his own son is not even an object, well, objectified to him. Yeah. Um, mm. But like you say, it's wonderfully animated. She does, she, she behaves like she a... She bounces. She does, like a, uh, like a schoolgirl that's got a crush, essentially, which is kind of what she does, and, and she laughs there. She She's, you know, she's um, very... Uh, away. kind of bashful almost but yeah in a, coquettish in a, yeah in, enthusiastic and, and just really cute and uh it is it's like she's talking to a to a crush and um and it's so fascinating when you consider that that shinji's watching this who shinji who is ostracized from his dad and he can't get anything out of ray at all despite the fact that he maybe wants to strike up a kinship with Ray because she's the only person that could possibly understand what he's going through. And so mm. she's um, emotionless and, and he sees these two people who should be so close to him, uh, but are so distant. But mm. they're so... And they're literally separated by an ocean of LCL at this moment. Yeah, and they're so warm towards each other. And it's you can, you can just... Uh, again, it's wonderfully animated, but you can see and just feel the confusion... Um, mm. and in, I think it's it, from a, from a character perspective, it, again, it's Shinji shows a lot of really awesome qualities in this that he doesn't get, um, credit for. Uh, but the fact that he doesn't become resentful to either, mm. I mean, he's, he's always resentful to his dad at the minute, but he doesn't become resentful to Ray. He's just, no, which if anything, do. it's like he wants to know her. Maybe through her, he can get to know his dad, perhaps. But yeah, there's a, a curiosity there, and yeah, and it's I, a potential kinship as well. I think, it, despite all the moaning and everything else, uh, it, there is a maturity to to Shinji. That, um, as I say, I'm gonna. Uh, this is a Shinji um, uh, reclaim the, the Shinji film. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm gonna reclaim Shinji's honor in this, uh, <laughs> in this, in this video and be like, no, Shinji's, and then Shinji's Dan will right. commit seppuku right at the end. <laughs> I'm gonna. I die will be his second. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh yeah so but anyway that's that's a really neat little scene uh mm. that again says so much um misato and uh risco at the bar um talking it over sorry we're gonna have to just dash through these a little bit quicker now because jesus christ it's like we're coming up to a four hour uh video so <laughs> um, as much as i would love to talk about this in depth I, I can feel the tiredness hitting me and it's like i'm gonna let dan take most of the rain on this one boring as that sounds for me but it's well like, we've spoken about it a lot anyway working. we've spoken about it a lot yeah. anyway just just their dynamic and it is more um more of that kind of thing just exploring their history and moving forward and their troubles and things uh ray's got a new security clearance card and they've <laughs> again because shinji doesn't have enough responsibilities it's like shinji we can't possibly use the postal service, so here. <laughs> <laughs> we can't wait till she comes into the office. You go to... <laughs> It'll be fun. I, I guess that, you know, they are doing it to sort of engineer. Uh, isn't it? It's Gendo's plan, isn't it? Gendo and Fitzky share a moment where it's like, yeah, we've got to get those kids closer together now because it will sort of, as always, benefit our, our ends. So, um, yeah, flood it down the chain. We we have new ID cards all of a sudden. Have, mm. have Gingy posted off to them. It's yeah. great. It's it's so he's so duplicitous. It's great, <laughs> and it's a really good scene as well. It's uh, another one of these iconic scenes from the series where Shinji gets his first look inside of uh, boobs. <laughs> boobs. No, <laughs> inside Ray's inner inner sanctum almost mm. because he doesn't know what to expect from her anyway. Cause she's just as we said, such she, a mysterious girl. She, she's mysterious and uh, and then and what we find out is horrible. <laughs> Yeah, and then to go in her room and find that she's not only a shell on the outside, uh, just you know, as 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 a person, she's a shell when she's by herself as well. She just exists in the same way that he yeah. does almost, um, but she's not doesn't even particularly seem to have the free will to even um, want to expand on her, you know, personality because it's like mm. Shinji for for as as numb as he is to everything, he still listens to music and um, what else does Shinji do? <laughs> uh, he tried to save Toji. He he hangs out with his classmen now, at least, you know. Uh, Ray's been at the school for we don't know how long, but she's still separated from the girls and swimming. But, you know, we cut to Shinji and sure, he's not socialising with the group, but he's still sat alongside them in a cluster. So, yeah, there's there's elements of development that Ray's not, even you know attempted and we find ourselves in ray's room and it's like the only um object that um is personal to her literally the only thing that uh, that shows a glimpse of what she values is gendo's glasses and mm. um that immediately takes his curiosity of course and tries putting them on it leads to shenanigans which is very in the vein of you know um 90s kind of um high school shenanigan anime yeah kinda love you know things of oh my god it's, groping it's, happens i've it's... slipped i've fallen on you i mean it is one of the all-time most impressive i i prep falls not the right term but the way it's engineered so that he falls over gets his bag hooked falls forward and manages to like explode a drawer of bras all over them it's like you could not replicate that if you tried it's like sigourney yeah. weaver dunking that basket without looking in any resurrection you know <laughs> you get you get one shot of that and shinji <laughs> shinji scored the home goal <laughs> um yeah i don't know if this i mean we, we've spoken about um the penguin and uh, and the nude scene and stuff and saying okay well that's that's par for course keeping a lot of the um, comedic feeling in from the early episodes in this I don't know if this is maybe I mean it's so difficult because it's such an iconic scene but would mm. you change it because it doesn't need that additional I mean the awkwardness is like yeah. they're both it's, they're both it's robot. needed for the awkwardness because now Shinji feels he's got something else to overcome in, mm. in the sense of well it's one thing that you were blanking me before but now we've got th this whole incident that uh, that we've got to factor into our social awkwardness um, yeah and she's angry yeah. at him as well which is which is another key point in this which you never see from Ray before she's angry mm. that he took the glasses and and so he tries to follow her but she's not particularly interested in listening to him and it's only when they get to the gates and the car doesn't work that she's like okay well I've got to pay attention to you now and even then she well it's not not even the... then she's yeah exactly she snatches it away and, and gets on with her life <laughs> mm. um, she doesn't seem particularly angry towards him just sort of like disinterested like 
why are you asking me these things? And I... Shinji just wants to learn a bit about his dad through her because of her exposure, and it all goes horribly wrong for him. I, I see a touch of anger, but I'm not willing to, you know, argue. Oh, there is a touch of, when on the, the elevator, it seems to have sort of oh, it, dissipated it a does. bit. Oh, when, so, when, she, when she smacks him? <laughs> just yeah just before the the scene when she swipes her card and the scene where she slaps him there's always there's almost a return to her default passiveness mm. uh as for for this scene yeah you could get rid of it i mean it's enough that he put on the glasses that's enough of a reason to work her but um i think it's, I, it's, I think it's just to show her indifference really isn't it i think that's that's the point that they're trying to make he's yeah li- literally on top of her with, he's with, literally with on top of her in a room she's naked beneath him and there's just nothing yeah. nothing there she she doesn't see it as a uh, sexual situation that she should be embarrassed or violation. about or violated about it's it's just something that happened and again i think she's more annoyed about him wearing the glasses that seems to her yeah. be a soul yeah absolutely uh, soul interest uh, but so she, but she's yeah. like oh so that's what a boob feels like and, uh, <laughs> and then pre- even at this speed it feels like it's still faster than the original version which Again, that <laughs> takes its time to just hold that still frame. Save save some money, but also hold that frame. Yeah, so then he stalks her, stalks her into nerve. And uh, mm-hmm. and this uh, elevator scene is, um, again, it's it's just another instance of, of how well they, they, they are building Ray, even though they, they don't do enough with her. Um, uh, yeah, how much she idolizes Gendo, because... Um, he he comes up in conversation and 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 Shinji says, "Well, uh, what does he say? Something like, why would I respect someone like him or something like that?" Yeah, something along those lines. So he he's never done anything for me. Why why should I care? Yeah, and Ray it's takes it personally much. because obviously he's like he's the only person um, that that is close to that matters. That, she, that matters, and so she she takes a mm-hmm. swipe at him, uh, which is a great bit of development for for this uh, particular. Um, there she goes. This particular version yeah. of Ray. Hmm. Uh, right. Okay. Um, right. So yeah, um, we are going to speed through this last bit, but I don't think it's necessarily too bad. We've said a lot about. Yeah, we're in the, uh, we're in the action scene now. Yeah, I mean, we, one one hour four minutes, and um, it's a one hour forty minute film, and this set piece pretty much does. It's, it's incredible how it covers the rest of the film, like 40, yeah, it's 40 half an minutes, hour, half an hour, 40 minutes worth of the film uh, from what is essentially, I think, just kind of 15 minutes in the series. But again, um, just to mm. kind of... Actually, I think it's the whole episode's worth, isn't it? Because right at the end of uh, Ray 1, uh, it's like, and what could oh. possibly go wrong? And then it cuts to Ray all over the city and then it's to be continued. So yeah, basically this 40 minutes is... is a double episode so oh god they have been really really efficient with the timing yeah they could they doubled the length of an episode and they still managed to find time for for the original six that's really impressive it is the the pacing um is excellent especially with mm. all the new things they added uh yeah i'm i'm a big fan of of um when because this, this is like our first look at a, a really weird angel it's just a geometric shape it's like mm. oh okay that's that's interesting um when uh, one of the weirder angels turns up at the midpoint and it's basically like a giant eye big orange eye with almost like clown hands coming off of it and it flashes up on screen and masato's immediate reaction is oh come on that's just ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> it's like even they realize that it's like that's not a good design <laughs> and yeah it's probably the best thing in in uh, the next film they really worked hard to uh to compensate for that one yeah to legitimize it i mean th- that's the interesting thing from from this point isn't it it's it's how abstract they get with these angel designs and they're trying to make the point that you know um we as humans see something uh humanoid as as the norm but actually when you look into the wider universe uh why can it not be possible for a geometric shape to mm. to to be the default and to be able to twist itself into drills and just mix and it's, it's it's a really interesting you know yeah. concepts that they've that they've come up with and I like that uh, shows a lot of imagination as well you think it's kind of like you know designing 150 new Pokemon for each game it's like well yeah, exactly <laughs> now we get ease and chandeliers it's like yeah but if done right yeah so it's yeah. um. It's it's difficult to come up with something new and novel that's going to work within the context of framing uh, an episode, but they 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 mm. do. They come up with a lot of 
interesting ideas. Um, well, it's it's an interesting one anyway because what they the, in, in the show Ramiel is is just a floating diamond essentially, and a drill comes out of it and it's just static in one place and it you know fires fires its lasers and uh, and that's about it. But in this, the whole thing just morphs and it's mm. ever expanding, changing shape. It's different attacks require different you know designs. Um, it's got that cool sort of whomp noise yes. as it as it floats, and uh, the great addition to this one is that sort of weird charge up scream that it mm. makes. It's almost like kettle uh, kettle on a stove over boiling. It sort of really gets in your ear it before it lets loose with this devastating beam. And just everything about the redesign of the soundscaping of this thing is great yes. when you consider that it's just basically a giant Excuse glass cube. Or just mm. yeah. Well said. They do a great job of making it just utterly horrifying with this banshee mm. scream. Um, it's great. And because you can't figure it out because of how it morphs itself into different things, there is that fear factor of the unknown about mm. it. It's not like a uh, uh, the first two that are just creatures and it's a matter of, um, you know, you you beat it in some way or another and you get to its core and you, and you just smash it a bit. This is mm. something completely beyond the realms of what we could ever expect um anyway so to get to the find itself um it takes out unit one pretty pretty sharpish and uh, they have to get shinji out of there otherwise he'll be boiled alive and um this is really interesting one of the interesting scenes from uh uh the gendo where um i think masato says eject him eject him uh, because you know he's in, he's screaming, he's in pain because he's been bored alive, and, and Gendo's like, no, don't do that. And uh, and you think, what you evil, evil man? And then mm. is it is it Risco that says, um, uh, if we do that, he'll just be more exposed and he'll die even quicker or something like that. He will yeah. be dead. So th- there is this uh, view into <laughs> it's kind of the shifting thing of of always oh, being Gendo's being a bastard rather than oh no, he's, he's just being logical but at the same time he can hear his son's screams yeah and it's like it doesn't affect him he's still being that logical that uh he's doing the right thing but it's not you know from... but is he though because it's risco that uh, Ritzko that leaps in and says well he'll die if he quits out again though doesn't go exactly he, just... <laughs> <laughs> he does what gendo does I just and him smiles to... behind his hands yeah <laughs> his eyeball infected hands um but anyway they get I'll... sorry go on I was going to say, I love the fact that um, they can't blow the platform because it's melted, so they essentially just blow the entire city block that is standing on and just sink the just entire sink. quadrant. It's a great image. Yeah, it's good. Um, so anyway, Shinji's severely injured and they put him into uh, recuperation. Meanwhile, the angel continue, uh, drills a hole uh, through the um, floor to get to... Um, uh, the uh, the geo front and then this um this is pretty much where the detail of the film shifts dramatically because up until mm. this point it's more more or less one for one aside from little few different things and this is like completely new territory for the most point of of how they um get to the action sequence because um skimming around through episode six it's kind of just they get a gun and they shoot it and and that's more or less the end of it. Yeah, they, we're going to reroute the power grid and then gun done. <laughs> yeah, they make it feel like a really epic uh, achievement. This and I I, mm. I remember the first time I watched it, thinking, "Wow, this feels big. This feels again." You, they 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 make it relevant to the nation rather than just feeling mm. so um, so secluded. Uh, the way you see Japan switch off and and uh, just the little shots they do with all the uh, electric ele- electricity grids and yeah uh, just humming and charging up yeah little details and, all, and all... the constant background chatter as well as people relaying you know which circuit breakers are mm. up what's down which direction the current's flying and it it is very much information overload because you're just being bombarded with this noise and text on the screen and shots of, of things and it just goes on for what about what feels like about five minutes not not in a bad way, but there's just so much going on to convey just the sheer complexity yes, exactly. of, of this entire operation. It's no small thing. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, Masato's plan is effectively like we're, we're going to take the country grid and, and just reroute it all into one gun and shoot this thing with all the power in Japan. Yeah. And what I, I love about this 
is um, Operation Yashida uh, is what it's called. And when the um, the floods hit uh, Japan back in uh, 2013, was it? 2011, 2013? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> The uh, one of the minister was in charge of the operation to, to sort of reroute the power. We named it Operation Yoshida, which again just shows how far Evangelion sort of permeates yes. the uh, the nation that they'd use an Evangelion reference for this <laughs> government operation to uh, to save people's lives. Uh, I'm just gonna uh, Yamato Operation Yamato. Operation Yamato. Uh, my pronunciation at the moment is just. Oh, Yashima. Just no, Operation Yashima. Sorry, I've got. I thought it was. I thought it was Yashima. 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 Operation Re Rebuild Events. Uh... I've got it spelled down. Oh, sorry. Do you? Okay, I just wanted to, to double check. There is. Um, I've got an Operation Yamato and an Operation Yashima. So if, if you're saying Yashima, then it. Oh, it is Yashima. Sorry, my apologies. I'm, yeah. I'm second guessing you, and I shouldn't. Uh, no, that's fun. <laughs> I, yeah, so I love the I love the dark round table conversation as well. That makes mm. it, it just makes it feel these little things that weren't in the original uh, series. That I just love the the conspiring aspect of it. Yeah, it's like these are where the decisions are made. These are planning meetings. This is where Masato comes into her own. This is why she's in this in in this position. And uh, and it's great just to just to see them all. Um, yeah, it's like brainstorming, trying to trying to uh, figure out the plan. I think it's mm. great. And and it's great to see her as boots on the ground as well, because I will probably see in uh, an upcoming shot. But, um, yeah, you know, it's not enough that she sort of pitches the idea. But then she, you know, she puts on a hard hat. She's on location. She's overseeing the operation from from the ground and getting the whole thing whipped up. You know, she really does take control of all this. Yes. It's, it's great to see that development of her as a character yeah. going from sort of... Um, petulant woman that can't organise her own life in her own apartment to someone that's literally, you know coordinating a, a country-sized the biggest event. operation in japan arguably yeah ever. yeah it's great yeah i, I agree um I, yeah i love these shots so much especially because they're mm. new of all these mammoth vehicles and yeah. they're, they're just uh misato and risco just walking in and out of them and uh yeah it just makes it feel alive um mm. so much more uh and and they're great you really feel the busyness of, of the operation uh, and all while there's a time run, of course, as well, uh, with um, the angel bearing down into the geo front. Uh, so Shinji's still. Oh God, everything's going so fast. Um, oh, look at Ray sat out there. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Ray's yeah. sat waiting to be able to see Shinji, but it's not for. She's not being sympathetic. She's got something to tell him, uh, which is that we're needed. Uh, you've just come out of the. Um, uh, being kind of um, sedated, I guess. Um, uh, yeah, that's good. As to, uh, yeah, or or resting anyway, because uh, of these horrible burn injuries, <laughs> possibly you literally boiling alive literally inside boiling of a, a metal alive. casing. Yeah. Um, and uh, but while Shinji is in this state, um, yeah. So this is the one where he's on the train. And um, it's, you're saying this is the conversation where he, he can hear Gendo and uh, Yui, his mum. Uh, Yui, yeah, yeah, and uh, and they could. No, it must be. Oh no, Yuki, 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 Yuki. Um, is it where they're discussing the? Which one is this? Uh, one? Yeah, it's like if 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 it's a boy, we'll name it Shinji. If it's a girl, we'll name it Ray. And then back and forwarding, back and forwarding, and then boom, awake again. But then there's the little Shinji boy um, that sat opposite in. Yeah. Oh, that's a, a benchmark of much later seasons, uh, episodes, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so I can't... Uh, all right, okay. Anyway, um, and then he wakes up, and Ray's there, and she's like, we've got work to do, and he's like, I don't want to do it. And so she's like, well, fine, don't do it. Just rest. And again, it's another one of these things of Shinji just being so confused about what people expect of him. <laughs> um, and uh, in the end... Uh, he doesn't go. He thinks, well, fine, I won't. And Misato has to come and get him. And mm. this is the first time uh, I think Shinji properly, properly, properly calls her out. And he says, you know what? You're all hypocrites. I'm, yeah, you're I'm, all hypocrites. I'm the only one sacrificing something here. You don't understand what I've been through. And um, this is when 
again sorry we're, we're skipping through so much but you know we've been doing this for over four hours now so <laughs> um and uh and so this is when masato's like okay i need to kind of be real with this kid now there's there's only mm. one thing i can do to to get through to him and that's to say that you know if he fails we all die <laughs> which i suppose could go the other way for him to be like you what <laughs> <laughs> you can't give me that kind of pressure i'm 14 <laughs> i only touched a boob for the first time yesterday <laughs> uh but she's trying to make the point of you know i'm making as much of a sacrifice as you are just in just in a different way uh because yeah. we're from my, comfy chair. <laughs> my comfy chair far away from the battle uh everyone that works at nerve is uh is, is making a sacrifice and they know that maybe they won't come out and um uh she uh, mixes saying this with you know the introduction to um, Lilith, mm-hmm. and uh, we've already spoken about the importance of Lilith and uh, bringing her into the um, uh, events earlier and how important that mm. is. Why is Lilith not appearing? <laughs> Jesus. Difficult. Uh, I, I love as well that we see the elevator going down through the floors, and then suddenly we're in a sort of weird amber liquid with giant nuclei and, and ganglia in it. And it's just like, what the hell is this? Yeah. Again, just trying to get that idea of exactly it, what is the geo front? You know, where does like, sort of like one thing begin? Where does the next start? What are we passing through here? Mm. It's it's very bizarre. I would love to see some nerd somewhere must have like done a full blueprint. Yeah. Here, I'll even take a simple drawing. Like here's, here's the geo front. Here's an elevator and just make crude drawings. But it's so difficult to grab a scope on putting this entire thing together, especially in the next movie, uh, not the next movie. Um, but yeah, two doesn't help, but three makes it so much worse with the descent and uh, episode 24 as well, when they're taking the, the crane down. Mm. And it's so difficult to get any sense of perspective. Yeah, I think they're essentially just trying to say this is as deep as you can get. They've buried yeah. this, this, this monstrosity as far down into the earth as it can. You've got basement level one, two, three, four, like dungeon and the interdimensional cthulhu level <laughs> <laughs> and then lilith right down at the bottom uh so yeah they're just trying to f- freak shinji out even more i guess because uh, that would freak me out it really would like it's a it's a bisected pilbury Dozeboy christ we- complete with beak head a plague doctor mask lots we- of little legs coming off of it and and we're all oh guess what shinji that stuff you've had in your lungs it's that thing's blood <laughs> <laughs> now get back in the robot and fight the good fight <laughs> And then, yeah, the the rest of it is um, pretty straightforward. This is the fight scene, and uh, Shinji and... Well, um, Misato gives Shinji uh, a voice recording, and it's Toji and, um, and, and Kensuke kind of saying, you know, we know what you've got to do. Go do it. Thanks for your efforts, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the second and final appearance of Pen Pen. Uh, and then... Um, Shinji and Ray have a really nice moment on top of the Evas, and it's a, mm. such an amazing shot of them on the, on the literally on the shoulders of giants. Um, yeah, uh, looking That's out. iconic. Yeah. How many times has that been replicated in the works of uh, Demond and and all the other art books where it's just the kids just sitting on their Evas? Mm. Ah, magnificent. Yeah, it's it's an amazing scene, and it's uh, the 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 conversation as well, where. Um, God, I wish I wish we had the subtitles because it it'd, it'd be great to read. It's all in uh, Ray's delivery as well. Of um, uh, I I will I will protect you and I will probably die, but I've been assigned to protect you and that is what I will do. Yeah, it's very cut it's and like dry. so cold. Yeah, very robotic and and matter of factish and uh, and and Shinji's now just almost. It's like he's. He's he's found a glimpse of his motivation, mm. knowing that uh, that he's not the only one making a sacrifice. Because not only are the nerve guys making a sacrifice, but uh, Ray is 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 making a sacrifice, mm. and he's trying to make her understand as well that she is making a sacrifice. She she is worth it in some way. He finds yeah. he finds hope almost in her hopelessness it's like no you shouldn't be like this with yourself but if you shouldn't be like that then i suppose i shouldn't be like that exactly yeah he's seeing himself mirrored back at him yeah it's yeah it's, it's really nice it's a really um 
uh, just a transformational moment for him, I think this, which is why it's such a great point to finish on, uh, finish the movie on after after yeah. the the uh, this this finishes. But it's great to see it sort of reflected back again in the next movie with like, oh, if Shinji can become a better person, then perhaps I can as well. And you know, for various reasons, we see her developing and growing and trying to fit in. It's just yeah, a lot of thought went into uh, these two movies. Yeah, I think so. Uh, mm. So yeah, just breezing past this. This is the. Um... The action sequence, it, it is, it's brilliantly realized. It is, it's it is, stunning. It is super tense. It, the animation and the direction is phenomenal. Um, the score. The, the score. Yeah. Um, Japan's uh, experiencing a blackout, so people are just stood around watching this this event take place. Um, yeah, it's Two fun- children versus a being that's almost as powerful as Captain Marvel. <laughs> yeah it's it's one of those moments where you're on the edge of your seat because you know how big it is and and um uh and everything is just so expertly fine-tuned to 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 feeling the tension and so shinji's got one shot or they tell him he's got one shot essentially you're going to do it in uh, in one go because if you don't do it, then you probably uh, won't get a chance for a second. Probably won't get a chance. It, really, and I, I like the fact that this entire operation is designed in a way to make sure that Shinji can't run away. <laughs> it's like it's, <laughs> that was the first thought in all of the design and the engineering that went into this plan. How do we ensure that Shinji cannot escape? <laughs> and then secondary, how do we make sure that he kills this angel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, anyway, he he takes the shot. Um, the angel's been distracted by, uh, like, um, being fired at with missiles and things. So he's kind of shooting off in different directions, and they're waiting for the perfect time to, to, to fire at it when its, uh, when its defenses are down. Uh, which they do, but something goes wrong, and he, and he misses. And so the angel gives the appearance that it's about to um, die, but it doesn't, and it uh, comes back even stronger and fires mm-hmm. a beam towards Shinji. And uh, it's like, oh shit, no, Shinji, Shinji's gonna That'd die. Be- I love the way the thing reacts to pain. It just becomes a giant, almost sea urchin. It screams in pain and then erupts in spikes. Yeah. And then it's just like, right, okay. And then just blasts. It, it Just watching a mountain being disintegrated by the, the beam of this thing is just like, Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> it's it is. so good. It is. It is. The... And then the the score to this is, uh, is a track called Angels of Doom. And it is so... Um, oh, what, what's the word I'm trying to think of, Dan? Um, uh, grandiose? Uh, intense. intense. Grandiose, yeah. It's grandiose and intense. And it's, it's like most of the music in this, it, it's just pitch perfect um, in its execution and, and its soundscaping. It is... I, how many times have I seen this film now? Probably a dozen, probably maybe even two dozen um, and everything else. And still, you know, you're, you're gripping your knees on you the are. edge of your seat watching this play out. It is so well directed. Yeah, especially after the first shot doesn't work and uh, you think Unit 1's been eviscerated and Shinji pushes himself up and he's like, no, this this is something I need to finish. And it goes from him lying on the floor uh, you know, crouching, trying to trying to be as subtle and hidden as he can. It's like this is just you know, it's like a Terminator moment almost. Mm. It's like no, this isn't a time for subtlety. This is a time for taking uh, the moment into my hand and and I just love how he picks it up. And it's like yeah. I don't care if I'm in full vision if I get blasted. This is just what I need to do now. And uh, sure enough, the angel uh, notices what he's doing and um, and and lets off a a, a blast. As Shinji's preparing to aim, and uh, and Ray jumps in the way, and that's a really special moment as well. Mm. As, as as Shinji's like, oh, you're doing what? You're <laughs> sacrificing yourself, kind of thing. Um, but then there's also the added tension of the fact that you can't just fire the gun because yes. this thing needs time to recharge. They, it goes through so many conduits. He's got twenty seconds, I think, while Ray's just being you know melted in front of him, and he's got to wait for this damn thing. And wait for the target to run because he has to switch to manual control. So it's just like the added pressure of, well, Ray's going to die. I can't get the alignment shot. It hasn't charged. If I die, humanity dies. You know, just, oh, it's so good. And is it the plug severed as well? So you've got the countdown of of the Eva has only so much power left in it as well. Mm-hmm. It's just oh. so many facets of this all come together at once to... I mean, we keep saying it. It's just it's just gripping. It is so gripping. It's, it's mm. perfectly executed. Um, and through every previous fight, we know 
what these stakes are. You know, they built this bit, so it's not like suddenly the power gets severed and they go, oh no, he only has five minutes because it's only got five minutes of battery life in it. It's like, no, no, we saw that in the previous fight, so now we can just wordlessly allow this five minute sequence to, to play out. Exactly. We know the stakes, we know we know what's gonna happen. Uh yeah, it's it's unbelievable. Um uh and then uh, and then yeah, um Shinji makes his shot and uh and it blasts through the beam and uh, and kills the angel and again it releases another one of these horrifying banshee screams uh that that feels I mean you hear it and it's terrifying and horrible to hear Ooh. but at the same time it feels satisfying that's the first yeah. time it feels satisfying to hear and you're like oh yes because this thing has been such a, a, a it's personal for Shinji you know this one's effectively tortured him yeah uh, I've refused to die and it yeah it, yeah it's a triumphant moment knowing that this thing is in pain yes and uh it blows up and it you know like the the blood explodes everywhere all of the geo front and it's just it's just literally penetrated through the geo front um uh, but shinji isn't particularly concerned about that anymore because he he sees what a state that that uh that ray's eva unit is and um it's kind of um fallen into a again uh whether it's it must be water because they're too far away mm. for it to be blood but it's red again anyway and he drags out the eva corpse and and um and yeah pulls out or knives out the uh the little uh plug tube thing and um and yeah we we get a as we were talking about earlier this is the moment where um shinji replicates what his dad did that did and he and he uh just is desperate to know if ray's okay and um pulls open the door and uh and yeah has a a, a really amazingly nice moment with her where yeah. she doesn't really know how to um how to understand the situation and uh he's just so happy that, that she's okay and um and uh, da, 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 what does she say uh what did she say it, it's something um really passive isn't it it's it's barely even congruent with the situation just yeah. like why are you crying or something like that it's just like i don't get it <laughs> yeah but then shinji says um you know uh, uh, you're you, you're you, okay, yes, actually. <laughs> uh, but then he's like, "You should smile" or something like that. I, I, mm. She says, "I don't know what to do in this situation" or something. And he said, "Well, yeah, I'm not too good could, with people." <laughs> and and he's like, "Well, you could smile." And so she smiles, and um, and then that's kind of like, yeah, the 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 bond has been created between them. Mm. And it's and it, it's 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 a nice moment. To it's a nice little way to to end it on, yeah. But then, ah, oh, but then. We pan to the moon, ba, ma, ma, ma. which will be nothing to people that haven't watched the the show. <laughs> it, oh my god! Can you imagine? In which case, the four hour breakdown of us talking about the movie they've probably seen a dozen times is doing absolutely nothing for them. But yeah. holy shit, Dan! Why is Caru on the moon at the end of episode six? Effectively, with Zele monoliths as well. Why uh, is he in a box? I was thinking about this. I always because uh, there's three other open boxes in front of him, and. Mm. Is that because they're where the other angels came from? Are they his? You know, is it sort of cycling through? And that it's sort is of like this is my uh, are there like seven other carus that are waiting to be woken up down the timeline when it repeats itself again? It's just what could it mean? That that is my interpretation. That there have been uh, three three other. Uh, did you say there are three boxes? Are uh, yeah, there? there's at least three uh, it, that are sort of open next to him, and then a load more. Yeah, um, and he says something about uh, what is it? It's like, oh, so it's the third child again, is it? Mm. Something. It's like he wouldn't say that if he hadn't already sort of experienced it and lived with it. Yeah, this is. And there's the real Lilith, as as we said at the uh, beginning of the show, all of eighteen hours ago. Uh, yeah, this this was the second point where Matt was like, okay, well that confirms it then. And <laughs> um, yeah, this this is another uh, hint that. Um, this is uh, the the cycle repeating itself yet another mm. time, and uh, as you say, Kara's like, okay, let's do this again. And, yeah, let's uh, rock and roll. I look forward to meeting you, Shinji Akari Kuma. Yeah. And then, boom, cut to black, and we're like, what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> when is the next film out? Uh, oh, we were counting down the months. <laughs> as a, as a way to finish the first film, it's um, 
you you don't get more of an explosion of uh, yeah of just like what the fuck are we doing that it's, it's amazing just stunning it'd be like if um let's say oh the original star wars that comes out you know 1977 star wars and then in, in 1997, you get the New Hope special edition with a few new odds and ends, but it's the same film. But then it ends with the Darth Vader, but I am his father moment. And that's how the film ends. Mm. And it's like, where the fuck did that come from? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, and then you cap it off with Beautiful World. It's just like, oh. mm. it's, it's magic. It's an amazing end to, to the film. It really is. Um, all these emotions flying all over the place. These You're feeling heartwarming to, about Shinji and Rei and then there's the what the fuck about uh, Karu and then yeah as you say Beautiful World comes on and it's, it's a really nice way to, to finish it um, uh, very quickly then, go yeah then we get a clip show of, of the upcoming film just like you're, you're coming down from the, the high of the, the cliffhanger ending and that beautiful beautiful song and then you're hit with all of this which is a combination of like completely remastered shots of, of some of our favorite moments from upcoming episodes and then unit six it's like what the fuck is unit six and what's it doing coming down from the moon so it's yeah that again that double whammy of like oh that looks gorgeous and that is new what is happening who are these angels who are the linen plus it's just like you, you can't comprehend how exciting this was this was uh, I'm trying to think of what it compares to. This is like the ending of Infinity War. If it ended with a cliffhanger trailer for Endgame's best moments, mm -hmm. but you had to wait, what, two years? No, three years we had to wait to see it. Um, it you just can't comprehend how excited we and the Evangelion fan base were to, to know that not only was more of it coming uh, with some of the best moments, but there was so much more new content to pick over. And, you know, we, we screen grabbed everything we could from this and we're trying to pick everything apart for, for months, for years, trying to work out what all these new shots and characters could actually mean. Seeing seeing Kaji and Asuka, who obviously aren't in this film as well, mm. were, were, were big highlights of... Uh of that and then it ends on this map can you remember what your emotions yeah. were of seeing our first shot of uh what would be the fourth child i suppose i think isn't it? uh, is uh it? yeah she would be would she oh wait no technically toji oh no toji isn't picked is he shows yeah she would be the fourth um so. uh, yeah it was just like new character you're ending on her why she must mm. be very important to things it uh, says um What's her name? I... Marie. Marie? Uh, yeah. I can't remember her surname, but it's Marie. M-A-R-I. Mary. Yeah, Mary. Mary. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I was that's thinking... right, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we didn't... Very, know... very exciting. Uh, I must... I never... I never clicked with Mary, though. I, I... Oh, God, no. She's a, she's a nothing character that apparently still has no development by the final film. So okay. well, uh, that's but... disappointing. What's that? Um... But yeah, at the time it was it was something new and exciting and different, and wondering how she played into things. Yeah, um, I had fears even at this time for the introduction of a new new character. But um, we will deal with Mary more in Evangelion two point zero or two point two two. You can not uh, advance. Uh, advance, yeah, yeah. Um, which we will do uh, hopefully next week. <laughs> You know, one of my, I don't know if I ever voiced it at the time, but one of my um, theories about, uh, uh, I'm going to call her Mary. Yes, go Is ahead. that what we can? Run yeah, Mary. Um, was that she was a clone of Yui, just like another potential attempt, uh, which, I don't know, maybe, maybe that is something they'll run with, but um, no, but yeah, I, it, I, it just felt like she, she is just a new character, which is yeah. a shame because she could have been, you know, something else that, ties things more into Ray and her backstory and it could have been really interesting to see you know something that was either a, a more developed version or or something completely different in that regard but uh, yeah what what squandered opportunity that hmm. just never had a chance to, to go anywhere really yeah as I say I wasn't particularly yeah. enthused to see her finishing uh, to see her at the end of the uh, in the next film kind of thing because mm. I, I don't know I, I, I've never liked to design as well I could it's very bland yeah and uh, and 
uh, that came to fruition. But we will deal with that next time. Uh, I think we've said everything we needed to say in this um, uh, four and a half hour, however long it is. Um, See, I don't think we've barely scratch the surface i feel that we were so all over the place initially trying to like explain this but we we've probably done it a disservice if anything well <laughs> i feel we did a damn good job <laughs> talking endlessly we're talking for five solid hours about evangelion which you know is easily done um but uh yeah i know i'm gonna wake up tomorrow and just go oh we didn't mention that we didn't talk about this we could have delved a bit more into this and this and we missed our shot doing it um but yeah it is just such it's such a rich series and and film in general yeah that it is really difficult to off the cuff um even you know schooled as as much as we are in it it is really difficult to convey all all the information and all the beats and all the characters and the significance of these things without you know just being too anal about things so mm. hopefully our, our passion alone should sort of be carried on into into it well um yeah, uh, I think the next film is the one where we can really go all balls to the wall with, because uh, mm. we're not kind of bogged down with. Essentially, we're just loading the original series with this one, aren't we? We're just kind of saying it's a, in many ways, it's a complete one to one crossover, and this is just all the things that we appreciate. Uh, the the next one will be, you know especially interesting to look at it from a separate standpoint and say yeah uh you know this is how it stands upon its own merits so apart from the hour and a half's worth of content well we'll be talking about well actually in the series they did this <laughs> so true. that will double the runtime right there um yeah so we could go for another few hours but we're not because uh I'm, I'm a bit exhausted now uh <laughs> you, you uh, woke up at six o'clock so you're on like 20 19 hours uh yeah is uh, is the length of your day so we will leave it there if you've joined us all this time thank you so much it means the world that you, you would sit and listen to us talk about evangelion for four and a half hours that's a bit mad um but we're going to do it all again next week for uh, evangelion 2 uh, you could not advance so hopefully you come back and you join us uh, mr matt thank you so much for your input today i've really enjoyed it you've been fantastic um yes thank you guys take care we'll see you next time goodbye <laughs>